Ladies and gentlemen, and to all of our online participants, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the Global Innovative Growth Forum 2020. My name is Homi Sorang, and it's an absolute honor and delight to be serving as your MC. Now, the GIGF 2020 will be held over the next two days, that is to say today and tomorrow. On behalf of the Republic of Korea Ministry of Economy and Finance, as well as the World Bank, I would like to express my sincerest gratitude to all participants for taking precious time out of your busy schedules to join us. Now, this year marks the second iteration of the Global Innovative Growth Forum. Under the theme of innovative and sustainable growth in the post-COVID-19 era, we will address key changes in global innovative trends and also explore how we can achieve sustainable growth through innovative digital and innovative green solutions in combating COVID-19. Furthermore, we would like to explore how international organizations and enthusiastic technology startups can collaborate in providing innovative technological solutions to close the digital divide for developing nations. So without further ado, let us begin day one of the Global Innovative Growth Forum 2020. To commence the opening ceremony, we have Mr. Nam Gi Hong, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Economy and Finance in the Republic of Korea. Please welcome the Deputy Prime Minister Nam Gi Hong. He will deliver the opening remarks. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let me first sincerely thank Vice President Victoria Kwakwa of the World Bank, the co-host of today's event. Vice President Vinton Cerf of Google and Science and Technology Advisor to the President, Park Su kyung I would also like to thank the international speakers for attending this online forum, despite the late hours in your time zone. In addition, we sincerely welcome all participants from home and abroad who have joined us online. The first Global Innovative Growth Forum held last year raised the topic of innovative growth as the key strategy for sustainable growth and sought ways to advance cooperation. One year later today, we are experiencing a number of fundamental and structural changes in the economy and society caused by COVID-19. First, non-face-to-face -face transformation is accelerating and the era of connectivity is just around the corner. After COVID, non-face-to-face -face behavior such as telecommuting and online education have become the new normal due to containment measures and social distancing, and demand for non-contact service is rapidly increasing. According to a recent McKinsey Global Survey, businesses' digital transformation has been accelerated by at least three years after COVID, and the industrial structure is rapidly reshaping around the non-contact industry. Second, our challenges have become more complex and difficult. For example, crisis response in the past had to focus only on economic issues, but this COVID crisis is a challenge of both the economy and health issues at the same time. The climate change response, which has also become a global agenda, is also a problem that cannot be solved by the efforts of a few countries alone. Major countries such as Korea, the EU, China, and Japan continue to declare carbon neutrality, but achieving the 2050 net zero requires development of currently seemingly improbable carbon reduction technologies and the unenvious process of reorganizing existing industries. In other words, we need to solve a more advanced system of polynomial equations. Third, the gap in innovation, including the digital divide, is widening significantly. The COVID-triggered economic and social structural changes are an opportunity for those who are ready, but a greater risk for those who are not. Low-income people who have little access to non-contact environment 
SMEs that are digitally under-equipped and developing countries that are hard-pressed to overcome the crisis at hand struggle to keep up with the new environment in the post-COVID era. As innovation-leading groups speed up, they are leaving a wider margin with the groups falling behind. Ladies and gentlemen, in response to this change in the environment since COVID-19, our innovative growth strategy must also change. In this context, I would like to highlight three major directions for such strategy, focusing on the case of the Korean government. First, we need to promote digital and green innovation befitting the post-COVID era. The entire economic and social structure should transform to be more non-contact, digital, and green, the new normal in the post-COVID era. The Korean New Deal, announced by the Korean government in July, is a national innovation strategy that invests 160 trillion won by 2025 to lead the structural transition to the digital green economy. We are building non-contact infrastructure in areas closely related to people's lives such as healthcare and education and accelerating digital transmission through data dam construction and SOC digitalization based on DNA, or Data Network AI. We will also promote Green New Deal by creating innovative ecosystems in green industries such as green mobility and by building infrastructure for renewable energy. We also plan to announce the 2050 Long-Term Low Carbon Development Strategy, or the LEDS, soon. But it's not only about fiscal investment. The current government also plans to provide legal and institutional support for structural changes by improving old regulations and systems to accommodate the new economic and social structure. Second, as individuals, companies, or countries cannot solve problems by themselves, we need to work together to find solutions and pursue shared innovation. Innovation cooperation is already taking place in the field. There is already what we call open innovation, where large companies share their data with startups to find solutions together and grow together. The Korean government is working to build a win-win innovation system by discovering and supporting models of large company and SME cooperation. In particular, we were able to stabilize the material, parts, and equipment value chain quickly by discovering and supporting buyer-supplier cooperation models to cope with COVID's impact on the global supply chain. In addition, we plan to establish a strong public-private partnership system for a win-win innovation of the so-called Big Three industry, future cars, biohealth, and system semiconductors, convert internal combustion engine parts makers into future cars, and strengthen the cooperation system encompassing buyers, fabulous, and foundry. Third, sustainable innovation growth is only possible through inclusive innovation. More people should participate in the process of innovation, benefit from innovation, and provide support so that no one will fall behind. One of the three pillars of the Korean New Deal, along with the Digital and Green New Deal, is a social safety net, which is to strengthen inclusiveness of innovation. Strengthening the safety net, including the introduction of a universal employment insurance system and the expansion of vocational education suitable for the digital era, should go with innovation. And also, the World Bank's Disruptive Technology for Development, or the DT4D Challenge, that utilizes startup innovation in developing countries' development programs is a good example. In the last DT4D Challenge 1.0, we were able to deliver goods by drone to Rwanda's remote areas and use blockchains to give incentives to young Colombians who participate in digital capacity building education. Especially in this DT4D Challenge 2.0, we, were, we are working with the Korean office of the World Bank to help our startups participate. In session 4 of this forum, domestic startups supporting DT4D Challenge 2.0 will present their innovation. We look forward to working with the World Bank to open opportunities for the Korean startups to contribute to the world. Distinguished guests, the poet Ralph Waldo Emerson said, do not go where the path may lead, go instead where there is no no path and leave a trail. 
COVID-19 will not be just a passing crisis, but a historic watershed that separates human history into before and after COVID. So our challenge today is to go beyond the limitations posed by COVID-19 and find a new way to create a post-COVID era for the next generation. I hope today's forum will be a valuable opportunity for us all to find answers together. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was the opening remarks by Mr. Nam Gi Hong, Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister of Economy and Finance in the Republic of Korea. And now I'd like to invite Dr. Victoria Kwakwa, the World Bank Vice President for East Asia and Pacific Region. Dr. Victoria Kwakwa will deliver the welcoming remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister Nam Ki Hun, for your opening remarks and particularly for your reference to the, the quote uh, by the poet Emerson. And thank you, fellow participants, World Bank colleagues, and distinguished guests and participants. On behalf of the World Bank Group, I am pleased to welcome you to the second Global Innovative Growth Forum. The focus of this year's forum is innovative and sustainable growth in the post-COVID-19 era. My special thanks to the Ministry of Economy and Finance of Korea for their strong partnership and continued collaboration with the World Bank Group. Last year, I visited Korea and participated in the inaugural GIGF. I saw firsthand how the forum brought together global leaders and experts to discuss and collaborate on harnessing innovation and technology to promote sustainable growth and development. And I'm pleased that the World Bank Group is once again partnering with Korea on this important forum for the exchange of development knowledge across borders and sectors. In a world struggling with an unprecedented pandemic, this forum is more relevant than ever. COVID-19 could have lasting impacts on the global economy by undermining consumer and investor confidence, lowering investments in human capital and disrupting global value chains. Depending on the severity of the economic contraction, the pandemic is expected to push an additional 88 million to 115 million people into extreme poverty this year, with the total number rising to as many as 150 million by 2021, according to the World Bank's Poverty and Shared Prosperity 2020 report. To help developing countries respond to the crisis, protect hard-end development gains, and plan for a resilient recovery, the World Bank Group is providing up to 160 billion in COVID-19 response support over a 15 month period up to June, 2021. At the same time, the crisis is bringing digital transformation and green growth to the forefront of the world's development agenda. The adoption of digital technologies has grown by leaps and bounds during the pandemic, providing new sources of competitiveness and reshaping the nature of work. For example, in Rwanda, after transaction fees were waived in March, the April weekly value of all kinds of mobile money transactions increased by 450% from pre-pandemic levels. By 2025, the digital economy is expected to contribute $180 billion to Africa's economy, that is 5.2% of total GDP. But expanded use of digital technologies 
also increases the risks of digital inequality. And the Deputy Prime Minister alluded to refer to this in his remarks. Globally, over 700 million people lack broadband connectivity, while over a billion lack formal identification. Countries must invest in digital infrastructure and digital identity so that citizens can access online services. Developing countries need innovative technology enabled solutions to meet the challenges brought on by the crisis. One important way of achieving this is through partnering with technology entrepreneurs and developers. And countries, including Korea, are also seeing the pandemic as an opportunity to transition towards a greener and more resilient growth path. The World Bank Group has long supported this transition by promoting green growth and helping address climate change in developing countries. For example, we continue to surpass our own climate targets, committing $17.2 billion for climate-related investments in fiscal year 2020. These investments support development projects in countries around the world that promote cleaner air, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and help countries become more resilient to climate impacts. It is clear that the focus of this forum on digital and green innovation is in line with many countries' needs, their aspirations and priorities as they emerge from the COVID-19 pandemic. And Korea, as a global leader on digital and green innovation, is a strong and critical development partner of the World Bank Group on this important agenda. The World Bank Group Korea Office is a global innovation and technology center that collaborates with Korean partners to help developing countries harness green innovation and digital technology for sustainable development. We look forward to continuing this partnership with Korea to promote post-pandemic recovery and help developing countries find new pathways of inclusive and sustainable growth. Thank you and best wishes for a fruitful and productive forum. Kamsamida, thank you. Thank you very much. That was Dr. Victoria Kwakwa, the World Bank Vice President for East Asia and Pacific Region. Now we have two keynote speeches prepared. It is with great pleasure that I welcome Dr. Vinton G. Surf, Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist at Google. Dr. Vinton G. Surf will deliver the first keynote speech. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, it gave me enough time to walk onto the stage. I really appreciate that. Uh, second, I want to say that Deputy Prime Minister Nam Ki Hung's uh, imaginative uh, presentation really sparked a great deal of uh, ideas for me, and as I suspect it will for others as well. And Vice President Kwakwa, your um, uh, articulation of the World Bank's global initiatives uh, is equally welcome. Uh, because it's clear that the problems that face all, all of us on the technology side are not confined to any domestic limitation. These problems are truly global in scope. The, uh, the pandemic doesn't notice anything about international boundaries, uh, nor does it care uh, who it is that is infected. It's a global and very, uh, literally, the pandemic is correctly characterized as a pandemic. Well, let me start out by saying that giving advice to Korea on anything to do with technology seems uh, almost uh, unworthy because the country has been so spectacular in the development of high tech uh, over the past 30 or 40 years. Uh, they have uh, they've simply been a leading light uh, in this space. But I will try anyway to offer just a few ideas for your consideration. The first thing that I would uh, observe is that concentrating on technologies that can be enabling 
is a very, very powerful idea. The enabling notion says that the technology invites others to make use of the enabling technology in order to grow new businesses, to invent and explore new ideas, build new kinds of technology, almost as if these were layered on top of each other, as they often are in the internet world that I live in, the architecture of the protocols is indeed layered. And for example, the basic core protocols of the internet, TCP IP, served as a substrate for the World Wide Web, the hypertext transport protocol, which layered down on top of that and took advantage of the then growing uh, global scope of the internet. And so it is this concept of enabling technologies which I think would inform much of the work of this forum and the future uh, thinking about technology development. The second thing that I would observe, and again, it has been demonstrated repeatedly uh, by uh, Korean businesses, is to focus not only on a domestic market, but also on a global market. Uh, the reasoning is pretty simple. No domestic market is as big as the global market. And so if you're going to do anything, you might as well focus on the largest market you can possibly address. And here, I think we all have a big opportunity. Again, uh, keeping this enabling notion in mind. Now, we've already seen how the COVID-19 virus has forced us to use these technologies in ways that uh, we might not have chosen to do uh, except perhaps over a period of more years. But the necessity to separate ourselves from each other, uh, to uh, avoid proximity uh, and even gathering together has forced us into this remote and online operation. But I think everyone participating in the forum will recognize that the uh, ability to work remotely, to work from home, is not uniformly distributed. There are many jobs that require proximity and those jobs have been very difficult to impossible to undertake. And that has had great economic impact on a significant fraction of the population. So we have high disparity here in during this pandemic period with regard to our ability to work, uh, to attend school, uh, to treat patients, in fact, one of the uh, interesting side effects of the pandemic has been to force us into remote medicine uh, where the doctor doesn't want you to come into the office because you might infect everyone and they don't have adequate uh, uh, protections. This does raise an interesting opportunity, however, and that's to achieve remote medicine, you need to know more about your patient, which suggests that the internet of medical things, sensors, which you could have at home and provide information to a medical professional might allow us to do remote medicine better than we ever could before. And that capability might allow us to deal with places where there aren't enough doctors anyway. Uh, but if we could get adequate infrastructure for internet communication, another big issue that Vice President Kwakwa pointed out, uh, if we can get that infrastructure in place, we can do things remotely that we could not do before. So we have this opportunity to take advantage of the core uh, internet infrastructure and to build on top of that. Well, I am sure everyone in this forum recognizes that apart from the physical equipment that's needed to build pieces of internet, the heart of the internet is software. And it's an endless frontier Anything you can figure out how to program is fair game. And the consequence of that, of course, has been rapid evolution of software developments in the internet environment, including the use of smartphones with literally millions of apps available. And so we have this energetic potential to invent new applications simply by writing new software. However, having said that, I'm sure everyone in this forum also recognizes that these uh, uh, infrastructures, these platforms <clears throat> are quite neutral and they don't know the difference between constructive and useful behavior and harmful behavior because the hardware and the software doesn't necessarily know the difference. What that means, of course, is that there are all kinds of potential hazards 
associated with the further spread and use of internet-based technologies and other similar digital technologies, which creates a big challenge for governments that might be trying to set policies to protect against harmful behaviors, uh, to software companies and providers of applications and, uh, and services to protect their customers from harmful behavior. And unfortunately, this is not just a technical problem. We can't write software that says, don't let anybody do anything bad. What we really need is to help people understand why some of these activities are so harmful and to tell them, please don't do that. And to say, if you do that, or if we catch you doing that, there will be consequences. In order to deal with the fact that a perpetrator of harm and a victim of harm might be across international boundaries, we are going to need an increased amount of digital cooperation across those national boundaries, as has been called for by the UN Secretary General in the form of this advanced digital cooperation concept. I am certain that our uh, friends in, um, uh, in Korea uh, will be very active in pursuing these kinds of objectives and contributing ideas so that we can make this online and digital environment safer for everyone, more productive for everyone, and perhaps more available and affordable for everyone. So there is still plenty of work to be done. I am certain that the participants in this forum will go away with ideas that will be beneficial to literally all of us around the world. So I thank you for the opportunity to participate. I look forward to hearing from uh, my colleagues uh, who will be speaking after me. And I certainly look forward to the documented results of this year's Global Forum. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. That was the first keynote speech delivered by Dr. Vintin G. Surf, Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist at Google. Now for the second keynote speech, I would like to invite Professor Sugyong Park, advisor to the President for Science and Technology in the Republic of Korea. Please welcome Professor Sugyong Park onto the stage. Hi everyone, thank you for the introduction. First, I'd like to thank the Ministry of Economy and Finance and the World Bank for hosting GIGF 2020. And this is my great pleasure to have this opportunity to share the Korean New Deal, the national strategy for our great transformation. In this talk, I will briefly talk about why we uh, launched the Korean New Deal and what it looks like. Similar to the original New Deal introduced in 1930s, the Korean New Deal was str stringently introduced to overcome worldwide economic crisis. Restricted movement across the border led to a significant plunge of the global trade. Korea also faces falling consumption, shock to the employment, and slow export. Bitter fact is that the crisis increased inequality. Data show that the impact of COVID-19 disproportionately affect the poor and the vulnerable. Therefore, in addition to recover from recession, we have to pursue social structural transformation to have inclusive growth. Moreover, the restricted social contract by pandemic expedite the worldwide digital transformation. Although there is no direct evidence that the effect of climate change on pandemic, many of the root causes of climate changes are known to increase the risk of pandemic. Therefore, COVID-19 led us to a great recognition of the urgent need for climate action. To overcome all these challenges, government has two major tools, the budget and the legislation. The budget investment could make new jobs and businesses. The legislative action could stimulate industries and private capital. The New Deal back then in 1930s injected budget to huge construction projects, 
like building roads, bridges, and dams to make jobs and industries. Then, for Korean New Deal, to which area the budget should be invested to create jobs and business? In which field the regulation should be reformed to make industry to be prepared for the future? To maximize a return on investment, let's focus our strength that Korean New Deal would make it even stronger. Korean IT power. Korea has the world's best in、uh, internet infrastructure. We launched the world's first commercial nationwide 5G network. With strong、uh, fiscal support and pro、uh, promotive legislation, Korean digital power will gain higher global competitiveness. This strategy is called the Digital New Deal. Another、uh, strategy is to confront very difficult but unavoidable challenge: the climate change. Korean government ratified the Paris Agreement and is prepared to submit the LEDs to UN by the end of this year. This will be very challenging and ambitious plan because Korea is a global industrial giant, having one of the world's largest shipbuilders, car maker, and steel maker, which contribute to the great portion of the employment and the national GDP. Therefore, to meet this ambitious challenge while maintaining industrial competitiveness, strong fiscal support and legislative actions are required. So, we designed another pillar of the Korean New Deal as a Green New Deal. With these two digital and Green New Deal, I'd like to add most important factor: the people, with emphasis. COVID-19 drove unemployment rate up high. Moreover, worldwide digital transformation will lead to a growing mismatch between the labor and the job, which would make the unemployment and polarization even worse. So, previously stated, digital and green New Deal should be founded firmly on the stronger safety net, the third puzzle of Korean New Deal. So I. So far, I explained why we launched the Korean New Deal, and now I will talk about a few examples of main projects of、uh, Korean New Deal. Let's start with the Digital New Deal. The key in the battle against the global big tech companies is the data. Global big tech companies gather the vast amount of data and use them to hold a prominent position in the market. But collecting a decent amount of quality data is very expensive and challenging for late comers. Big data and AI complement to each other, so one improves the performance of the other. Therefore, help our IT industry to gain global competitiveness. We launched a signature project of Digital New Deal called Data Dam. Data dam is a cyberspace such as portal, computer server, or cloud system where the huge data are collected and used for services. And this animation shows the data lifecycle of the data dam, from various IoTs, sensors, and robots. Data are collected. The collected data are accumulated in the cloud system called data dam、uh, through the high-speed networks. Then these collected data are processed to be ready for AI training and open to public for AI services like、um, smart factories, autonomous vehicles, smart energy management systems, etc. In response to the industrial needs, Data Dam project is currently collecting over a hundred categories, including corpus and medical images. In addition to this. Government-owned huge public data will be also released to the data dam. For those who want to use data for business, may not afford the high computing capacity, appropriate AI solutions. So, to support those startups and small businesses, we issued vouchers for purchasing data and use AI resources. To build this data ecosystem, ranging from collection to the services. Government will invest about 18 trillion Korean won, expecting to create it over 380,000 jobs along the way by 2025, only in the data dam project. 
With the pandemic as a moment, momentum, on-tech service market is growing. So to be ready for that, Digital New Deal will provide infrastructure for on-tech industry. Considering the importance of quality education in the times of pandemic, we will provide high-speed Wi-Fi to all elementary, middle, high schools across the country, and also replace old laptops, servers, and network facilities. Remote working solutions will be provided to small and medium enterprise to offer them flexibility to deal with unexpected pandemic situation. These are only a couple of examples for the projects of the Digital New Deal, but I hope that this will help you to grab an idea how Korean New Deal helps to create jobs and expand the markets. Now let's move on to the Green New Deal. Recall that the Green New Deal was introduced as a climate change um, climate action. So the ultimate goal would be to reduce the carbon footprint. One way to do this is to consume less energy. For example, by remodeling buildings energy efficient. The green remodeling starts from about 200,000 old public buildings, like schools, rental housings, public offices, community centers. Every town has public facilities, so local workers, construction companies, material suppliers could participate in the projects and share the benefits. And this nationwide remodeling program will boost up eco-friendly construction enterprise. Another way to reduce carbon footprint is to generate electricity carbon-free. We have continuously implemented renewable energy systems like photovoltaic wind farms over the years. But finding a generation site is often challenging due to a limited uh, land availability and social acceptability. To expand the power generation sites, we will build a large-scale offshore wind parks. Since we have one of the best shipbuilders, offshore engineering industries, and rich supply chain capabilities such as machinery and strip production, through this offshore wind park project, industries will gain global competitiveness and create many jobs in the field of construction, operation, and management. To increase the social acceptability, local residents of offshore wind park will participate as a stakeholder to share benefits. Smart grid system for effective management of renewable energy will be implemented, and we will expedite the construction of electric and hydrogen charging stations as well. Lastly, but most importantly, all these grand plans of Korean New Deal should place on a highest priority on people. All these grand plans should be based on the firm foundations of inclusiveness. To offer a stronger social safety, network, safety net, over 28 trillion Korean won budget will be injected. Data show that there is a greater shock on the vulnerable group during the time of crisis. To strengthen this strategy, safety net for un un unemployed, we will expand the coverage of unemployment insurance to the freelancers, platform workers, and self-employed workers. Various subsidies are designed to remote, uh, promote the employment and help unemployed to focus on their job searching. In addition to the strong employment safety net, a stronger social safety net is also important. The eligibility of the criteria for the basic livelihood security benefits will be gradually relaxed within two years' time span. Pilot program for sickness benefit will be also launched. To help people be ready for a great transformation era, we will provide various trainings and educational programs for different levels of expertise. For those who pursue professionals in IT fields, Advanced AI degree program will be offered. For those who are considering job transition, various non-degree online, offline uh, AI skill trainings are offered. For those who are at the risk of digital divide, regional community centers will open digital uh, learning center so that residents could learn basic daily uh, digital skills like kiosk ordering or mobile ticketing, etc. Including training center instructor, 
operators, organizer, we expect to create 180,000 jobs by 2025. Finally, to produce fruitful results of the Korean New Deal, we will utilize all government measures. The supplementary budget and the fiscal year 2021 budget will be injected to expedite the Korean New Deal. The government budget will play as priming water, attracting the pumping of private capital. Both digital and Green New Deal program involve many innovative attempts for transformation, which often requires the uh, reform or removal of strict old state or dated regulations. We will keep in close communication with private sector to reform the rules and regulations. To attract market liquidity to investment, we will make a K-New Deal fund. This fund also aims to make profit sharing from K-New Deal investment project available to general public. Finally, to invite more participation of people and industries, this New Deal project needs to be implemented, customized as two regions. Almost half of the total New Deal budget is spent at the regional site. And local government funding contributes to the total New Deal budget about 50%. So, to expedite the balanced development of the country, we will strongly support and promote the regionalized New Deal project. Despite being triggered from the unprecedented pandemic crisis, Korean New Deal envisions not just to recover from recession, but to take a big step further to turn Korea into smarter, greener, and safer global-leading country. Hope this helps you to overview the Korean New Deal, and I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Su Young Park, for that wonderful presentation. Once again, that was Professor Su Young Park, advisor to the President for Science and Technology in the Republic of Korea. Okay, we will now move on to the first session for GIGF 2020. It is titled Transition to Non-Contact Society and Digital Innovation. We have four speakers lined up for this session, with each presentation lasting around 10 minutes. This will be followed by a 30-minute panel discussion. The session will be moderated by Professor So Young Kim, Director of the Korea Policy Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. Please join me in welcoming Professor So Young Kim onto the stage. Good morning and good evening. Welcome to the first session of GIGF 2020. I'm So Young Kim, Director of the Korea Policy Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution at KAIST. I'll be moderating the first session. In this session titled Transition to Non-Contact Society and Digital Innovation, we'll be exploring the innovative potentials of advanced technologies, especially digital technologies, for inclusive and uh, human-centered growth in the increasingly non-context society. Ever since the creation of the first modern digital computer, ENIAC in 1945, uh, we have seen in the last five decades uh, remarkable progress of digital technologies and infrastructure uh, that undergird our economy and also practically define our everyday life. In particular, latest development of AI technologies, especially um, machine learning or deep learning due to marvelous computing uh, power has enabled seamless integration of physical and digital spaces, uh, changing uh, many areas of human experience. This year in particular seems to be a, a very special year just because it seems to be becoming a watershed for the project, uh, trajectory of digital technologies. Um, 
because COVID-19, uh, once a century crisis, is really supercharging uh, the potentials of the digital technologies uh, in making uh, our everyday life just uh, sustainable by, uh, by allowing many, many um, everyday uh, functions just going on. So um, for the first session, uh, I'd, I'd like to introduce uh, each speaker just when they present their, uh, when they make their presentations. Today we have an incredible assortment of presentations running uh, from the core computing technology underlying digital uh, innovation uh, by Mr. Tra Stryer from NVIDIA and one of the best applications of big data analytics uh, for tracking epidemics by Dr. Khan from Blue Dot, and also uh, the impact of automation on work and skills by Professor uh, Brynjolfsson of Stanford University, and finally the implication of increasingly advanced digital technologies for global digital divide. So let me just introduce the first speaker. So first speaker, Mr. Keith Stryer, uh, is vice president and leader of a worldwide AI initiative at NVIDIA. Um, Mr. Stryer uh, was recently appointed by OECD as a co-chair AI Compute Task Force, and also he is a special advisor to the UN Center of AI and Robotics at The Hague. Uh, for the viewers, uh, I'd like to recommend you just to check uh, the profile, more detailed profile of uh, each speaker on our website because their profile is really, really long. So uh, we wouldn't just uh, spend much time on introducing everybody in detail. So please check the website. Okay, uh, Mr. Stryer, are you ready? Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay, yes. Go ahead. Okay, terrific. Well, first, I'd like to thank the Ministry of Economy and Finance and the World Bank for this wonderful event and very honored to be on this panel with my esteemed uh, colleagues. Let me uh, share my screen and jump right into it. Okay. So uh, we only have uh, 10 minutes or so. Uh, you know, I, I have the privilege of being a vice president at NVIDIA, which is uh, one of the fastest growing, most innovative companies in the world with, 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 uh, with just a very interesting history. And I think in, in, in trying to share some ideas, some input and some wisdom in this particular forum, uh, even though we only have a short period of time, I'd like to start with really talking a little bit about the history of the company because it really sets the stage for this conversation. Uh, you know, about 30 years ago, a band of brilliant engineers got together and conceived of this new kind of processor called the graphics processing unit right there. You can see a picture of the first consumer GPU uh, about 20 years ago, basically. Um, and, and Jensen Wong, the, the CEO and co-founder and, and his, his, uh, his colleagues, you know, they, they didn't just uh, invent a chip, they, they unleashed you know, our imagination and, and really launched the, the modern era of graphics and the modern era of gaming, uh, right? And now today, uh, millions, uh, millions and millions, tens of millions of gamers get lost in these synthetic worlds uh, like Fortnite and Minecraft, uh, you know, thanks to this, this technology and all the artistry that it powers on top of that. Uh, now, of course, the company is not just a gaming company and this is not just about chips. In fact, over the past 30 years, what's so incredible is just how this company has pursued this vision of, of this full stack innovation model of really focusing not just on the engineering, which is, which is at the core of the company, but, but creating, uh, going from a chip to an accelerated computing platform company and, and, and sort of these four basic layers of, of innovation that, that uh, happen continuously in the company. And it's, it's almost dizzying uh, to, to work in NVIDIA because of that, uh, you know, you have the, the hardware layer, of course, and the incredible engineers that work on, on, on the physical hardware itself, the chips, the systems, the, the network technology, all the things that, that, that either go in and inside the box uh, but but that's just the, the part of it. And what's interesting about NVIDIA is we actually have more software engineers than we do hardware engineers. So so just incredible libraries and, and operating system software across the across the whole spectrum. And there's one common so actually operating system called CUDA that stretches from the largest hyperscale data centers all the way down to a hundred dollar drone. Uh, but but the the hardware plus the software and of course that's all 
multiplied uh, by the innovation in the open, you know, in, in the community, in the data science community, the computer science community, all of these open source frameworks that are accelerated on top of our platform uh, and, and then applied towards, you know, almost a limitless number of use cases. And then above that, you have these incredible ecosystems of, of partners and applications, you know, sort of beginning in the fields of science, but then stretching outwards to, to the creative industries and ultimately uh, across the public and private sectors. So it is these four levels of, of innovation that, that are continuously churning, you know, sort of inside of NVIDIA and, and, and accelerating this sort of convergence, right, of, of digital and physical uh, in, innovation. And, and, you know, now today, you know, you, as you're walking down the ca a campus uh, in, a, in a university, you might see, uh, you know, one of these robots sort of whiz by you to bring someone their pizza or their sandwich for lunch, right? And, and, and it's not gonna slam into you because it has an awareness of the environment and it, it's not just following a course, it's navigating the, the physical world using the intelligence that's, that's been trained in a larger system and then embedded into, into its onboard brain. And, and that's, uh, you know, that's part of our world now. And then increasingly that level of intelligence and autonomy is gonna find its way to, our, to the roads, right? And starting in 2024, this next generation of Mercedes uh, will not just be cars, they will be software defined vehicles that will have supercomputers in them that are so powerful that they, that they are actually far more compute that's needed on day one that, that they have been scoped specifically to anticipate years of innovation that will follow features that we don't even know exist today. Uh, and, and the hope is that, that this, this new generation of technology won't just be safer and a better experience, but it will actually go up in value over time based on, on the combination of human and technology innovation. And, and then of course, you know, back in the data center, you have these incredible AI supercomputers that have evolved over the last uh, 20 years, really, when you think of the modern era of high performance computing, but really just the last eight years since the sort of convergence of our GPUs and deep learning really exploded uh, it, uh, in 2012. This is a picture of Celine. Uh, Celine is our newest supercomputer. It's actually, we have multiple uh, you know, of, of the world leadership class computers. We have multiple ones uh, at our headquarters in Santa Clara. This one was just built and, and operationalized this year and actually in less than 30 days. And Celine is, is the fastest industrial AI supercomputer in the United States, the second most efficient and sustainable computer in the world and the sixth fastest in the world as well. And it has, it, it, it measures what we would call a one exaflop and it's not worth going into the technical details, but that the speed of this one machine is equal to the next fastest 160 computers combined, just to give you a sense of that scale. Now, you know, so you have these machines and you have hundreds of these around the world of, you know, different sizes. And, and, you know, the question is, how did we get there? I mean, how, how is it that we have these incredible tools and, you know, the, the, the standard metric for, for the sort of the trajectory of progress in the computing industry has been this Moore's law concept, which has been around for, for several decades, really, you know, and it's been widely practiced and proven and documented that roughly every two years, you know, the density of the transistors in a chip has doubled and, and so forth. And that has been a very important, uh, a very important trend for the industry, but that trend is leveling out. And, and what, you know, what, what uh, Christopher Mims in the Wall Street Journal recently noted is that the new trajectory uh, of innovation, the arc of compute power no longer maps to that, uh, that rule because really Moore's law was really anchored to, uh, to progress in manufacturing, to efficiencies in, in the ability to produce the, these chips. The new law, which, which has been coined as Wong's law after our CEO, is really about the integration uh, of both the hardware and the software. And when you combine those two, the trajectory of innovation more than doubles every two years. And now you're, you know, now you're looking at hundreds of times of, of performance, not doubling, but again, more than doubling. So just in a period of five or six years, you know, our, our, our the, the performance of our systems have improved more than 300 times. And so, and, and that's barely keeping up with the scale of, of, of the data sets and the data models that they're powering. So this is just the new, the trajectory. Now, when you have this kind of power, what can you do? How can you apply that? Because you can apply that in many, many different ways. And one of the more interesting ones, frankly, just, you know, for what it's worth, given the, the, you know, the, the incredible health crisis we've been all experiencing around the world, the, the, the uh, uh, in the pursuit of, of, of a COVID uh, of, a, of a cure, of a vaccine, of treatments. Uh, the the uh, One of the labs, uh, Oak Ridge, which is working on a system called Summit, which is very similar to our Celine system in terms of its scale and its power, uh, 
uh, and, and powered by NVIDIA ha has been able to take the time that it would normally take to look at uh, a billion uh, compounds. So the, the targets for, for identifying a vaccine, to look at a billion compounds, that would normally take 12 months of, of research and effort. And that would be you know, considered a, a, quite an accomplishment. Applying this high performance computing and artificial intelligence and, and all of these different modern tools, that time period has been, has been reduced from 12 months to 12 hours, right? So 25,000 targets are evaluated, not every hour or every minute, but every second. And so that's, I mean, that, I mean, just try to grasp that, that speed. So that's the power of speed and innovation in a, in a very real life way that's making a difference uh, in our world. Now, uh, to, to sort of bring full circle, because the, the, the name of this presentation was Accelerating the Physical and Digital Innovation. You know, one of the really, really cool things that, 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 that's coming, to, uh, coming into play is this new platform we've developed called NVIDIA Omniverse. And this is the first truly interoperable collaboration platform that creates high performance simulations of complex 3D environments. And that's a lot of words, but, but what that really lets you do is it lets you simulate reality so that you can create new reality. So let me just give an example. You know, it, when you come to design a building and that's actually a picture of our headquarters, by the way, that's an actual picture of the headquarters that is under construction right now in Santa Clara. Now we didn't, I mean, visualizing and designing buildings inside of uh, computers is not a new idea, but we didn't just design it. You could actually feel it. You, we simulated every ray of light Every, every, every light beam, every sound wave, you, you could actually, we could determine what it would feel, how comfortable would it be to sit behind this desk in this office? You know, what would it be like to have a crowd at this part of the lobby? How would that affect the, the ability for other folks to, to actually focus on their work? So this is not just about designing and visualizing, this is about feeling and experiencing technology and, and, and innovation in a simulated world so that you can create it, frankly, more perfectly in the, in the physical world, like designing a car, but not just what the way the car looks, how about how it feels, how it drives, how does it feel to sit in the car and hold the steering wheel? And probably one of the more interesting applications will be robotics. And, and, and this is where I'll just kind of go back to the car example, because really what machines, as you go from artificial intelligence to autonomous machines, you need to train these machines. And this is quite an extensive process. And it's much more efficient and frankly, safer to train these machines in a simulated world than in a, than in a physical one. So much like the Matrix movie, you know, the, the future of, of this kind of technology innovation will be not only to design, but to train these self-driving cars, these industrial robotics, these human care robots, whatever it is, they'll actually learn inside of a hyper-realistic 3D world like the one that we, we're showing here, powered by a supercomputer, because you need that kind of compute to make this work. And then once that's learned, a machine learns what its job is and how to do it safely, it'll be downloaded into the physical machine and off it goes, you know, again, whether it's hitting the road or hitting the factory floor. So this will be the new sort of brave world of, of digital physical convergence powered by not just uh, computers, but artificial intelligence and of course, human ingenuity uh, altogether. So uh, I think I'm out of time. That's my 10 minutes. So I'll just wrap it up on that point. Uh, thank you again for letting, uh, letting us participate. And I will give the screen back to the moderator. Thank you very much, Mr. Stryer. It's really uh, um, wonderful or amazing. And it's really hard to imagine the, the ultimate limit of computing power. And one thing that is for sure is that NVIDIA has become really a household name these days, uh, like Google or Apple, because just only a few years ago, it was relatively a kind of a cult company, more or less known to uh, gamers and developers of gamer, ga gaming. But anyway, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, the next presentation is by Professor Eric uh, Brynjolfsson, who is the director of Digital Economy Lab at Stanford Institute of uh, Human-Centered AI. And also he is a research associate at US uh, NBER. Um, well, Professor Brynja Olsen is so famous, so I don't really need much introduction, but he has authored nine books, uh, and most of them are already uh, bestsellers, and I guess the most famous one is The Second Machine, a machine uh, Age, uh, Work Progress and Prosperity in a Time of Brilliant Technologies. And uh, he has many stories to tell today, so I'd like to ask you again, uh, to limit your presentation to uh, 10 minutes, but we will have uh, plenty of time for discussion. Okay, Professor Brynjolfsson, can you just start off? 
Sure. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for that very kind introduction. And it's a real honor to be here at the Global Innovation Growth Forum. Uh, the other speakers have been just fascinating. And I'm looking forward to sharing some of the research we've been doing here at the, uh, at the Stanford Digital Economy Lab. So let me share my slides here. And I hope, uh, hope you can see them now. Um, I'm going to talk about the uh, AI awakening and what it means for the economy. And what I mean by that is just some really uh, awe-inspiring improvements in the technologies and how that's changing work and employment and productivity and what we need to do to, to do even a better job. So let me just uh, remind you all, and you've been hearing a bit of it, uh, Keith gave a great uh, explanation of some of the remarkable breakthroughs and some of the fundamentals and the and the hardware and the software, the algorithms, the data, these things have combined to allow us to do things that previously only humans could do. For instance, here's data from uh, ImageNet. Um, and as you can see, machines used to not be very good, but then with the introduction of deep learning in 2012, um, they really took off and are now in many cases exceeding human performance. Um, you see this not just in, in you know, faces or animals that you might uh, recognize in, in Facebook and elsewhere, but also in uh, medical imaging and, and a number of other kinds of applications. There's still a long way to go and there are places where humans uh, still have a significant advantage, but it's been quite a, a transformation. And as an economist, when the machines start becoming equal to or better than humans, it's a threshold that's very important for economic decision-making in terms of uh, which type of entity, human or machine, you assign to different kinds of tasks. And of course, it's not just um, vision, um, basically, any supervised learning systems are now able to address almost any type of task where you have a well-defined set of data for the inputs, X, and well-defined outputs, Y. And you can see whether that's speech recognition, or trading, or pharmaceutical R&D. Uh, there's just some amazing work on uh, protein folding uh, that by uh, uh, Google's DeepMind unit, the, uh, the AlphaFold group. A fraud detection, you could go on and on. I'm confident that uh, everyone in this, org everyone in this uh, conference that is in an organization that could have dozens of these kinds of opportunities now to take advantage of. Now, I could talk more about the technology, but what I really want to transition to is talking about what's going to happen to the workforce and wages. And the way most people think about this, and really I thought about it mostly at first, is that technology can be a substitute for humans and replace what humans are doing and that's a natural way to think about it. But we dove in a little bit deeper and doing some work with, with Tom Mitchell. Uh, we identified actually six main categories that economists talk about that the technology affects wages. In addition to substitution, for instance, it can complement or make human labor more valuable. It can affect demand and incomes and supplies, and it can even lead to new tasks and the transformation of work. These other five possibilities, in addition to substitution, are often more important. In fact, historically have been more important and we know that because over the past two or 300 years, human wages have not gone down, they've gone up. So the value of human labor is increasing as machines increase the value of it, complement it, and uh, lead to new invention in these different ways. Now, we have a very big project looking specifically at the places that machine learning is going to change work the most, which tasks. And uh, the first uh, premise understanding is that Currently, machine learning is very far from artificial general intelligence. I know that in some of the great science fiction books, you hear about machines that, you know, like the Terminator, they can do essentially everything a human can do. But we're very far from that. We will be for, for decades. Um, but what we do have, as I mentioned, is machines that are working at human level or superhuman level. And the interesting question then is which tasks um, are suitable for human level and which tasks are not suitable for human level. And the way we went about it is we looked at about 18,000 specific tasks and ranked every single one of them based on their suitability for machine learning using this, uh, this rubric that we developed. Um, and uh, one of the things that we found was that even if you pick the very best, the, the, the tasks that are very easiest for machines to automate, the top 90%, um, you get over $700 billion of tasks from just in the US economy that are automatable and uh, 10 times that uh, worldwide. You can also zoom in on individual uh, occupations. Uh, these red dots represent uh, 900, over 900 occupations in the United States economy, and similar uh, mapping into Korea or other countries. And uh, on the horizontal axis, a scale from zero to 100 is the relative wage of that job. For instance, on the left are, are relatively low paid jobs and the right are high paid jobs. The vertical axis is the score we gave it on how suitable that task is for machine learning. Higher 
uh, on this graph are jobs that are more suitable and that have a lot of tasks that are suitable for machine learning. And for instance, cashiers are relatively low paid, but much of their work can be automated uh, with vision recognition and other tools. Um, there's some high paid jobs like uh, airline pilots that uh, also are suitable for machine learning, but the overall slope is, is downward implying that the low wage jobs tend to have more of their tasks suitable for machine learning. And of course I couldn't help peeking and seeing where economists came out. We are paid pretty well, maybe not as well as some economists think they should be. Um, and for now, um, a little below average in terms of the ability for machine learning to take over some of the tasks. Uh, we can also zoom in on any given individual company. So we've developed a tool where we can look at the different jobs in the company and see how they might be transformed. For instance, we work with a big bank and we looked at uh, hundreds of different occupations, including this one, a personal banker. And as you can see in the upper right, um, while personal bankers are very vulnerable, there's possibilities of personal bankers transforming their job and becoming what we call personal banker 2.0. And uh, what this means is really learning more of the low uh, machine learnable skills and, uh, and, and eliminating some of the skills that are easiest for machines to do and transferring them over to machines. Uh, but we can also have them transfer to new roles like a business analyst, mortgage loan officer. And in the bottom right, we have a, a mapping of how similar the skills are in one role to the other role, which gives you a sense of how easy it is to make that transition. So our hope is that while machines will transform many, many occupations, they'll also give us a tool for mapping how to do things differently. Let me take a few minutes to talk about productivity, which is a bit, frankly, a bit of a puzzle uh, for many economists. Uh, I think there's no doubt that the Underlying technologies are, are awe-inspiring and in some ways even, uh, as Keith said, exceeding the progress in Moore's law. Yet uh, you may be surprised to know that we have not seen a productivity boom. In fact, the reality is that productivity growth has slowed everywhere. Uh, for over a decade now, the rate of growth of productivity, while still positive, is not as great as it was previously. Specifically in the U.S., it used to be about 2.8%. Uh, per year, and now it's growing only about 1.3%, including last year it grew about 1.3%. And, and of course, 2020 will be a, a very unusual year once that number comes in. I double checked on Korea and, and actually disappointingly, the slowdown has been even greater in Korea. Korea grew faster um, in the early part of the period. And uh, since in the past decade or so, Korean productivity growth has been even slower than it was in the United States. And you know, it's not unusual for this to happen. In fact, 29 of 30 countries saw comparable or larger slowdowns in, as we just saw, I just showed you in, in the uh, United States. So that's a bit of a puzzle, isn't it? Because I don't think uh, that the technology is, has stopped yet we haven't turned it into productivity. Now there are several different explanations. I wrote a paper with Chad Severson and Daniel Rock describing some of these explanations. Um, and let me just go through each of them quickly. One is that, you know, maybe we're overrating the technology. I, frankly, I don't put too much weight on that, but some people do. Another important one is that we're mismeasuring the benefits. And there's a lot of evidence of this one. Um, in particular, um, many of the benefits of these new technologies result in digital goods and services like uh, uh, GPS maps or Zoom. It's appropriate that we're uh, using this right now. Um, Google search, Wikipedia. Um, these benefits, I think, are very large, but they don't have much of an effect on GDP because GDP measures everything that has a positive price. So if something has a zero price, then it has a weight of zero in GDP. In turn, productivity is GDP divided by hours worked. So if you're not measuring GDP correctly, you're also mismeasuring productivity. That's a big problem, and it's one that's getting worse as we get more and more digital uh, goods and services. Uh, there are also concerns about the distribution, more of the benefits going to a, a smaller group, 1% or one-tenth of 1%, and the median person not participating. There's a lot of uh, what economists call rent dissipation that results from that as the, uh, as the gains are not widely shared. And then uh, finally, the one I really want to focus on actually is explanation number four, that it's not enough to have an amazing technology. You also have to implement it. And that often means, almost always means, uh, reskilling the workforce, restructuring organizations, changing your business models. Um, and that takes time. What we found is that that kind of reinventing of an economy, reinventing of a business, reinventing of an individual skills can take uh, years or even decades. Um, 
In short, technology is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, less than one, sorry, less than 10% of the investment um, is in the hard technology, hardware and software. Uh, the rest of the investment needed is in organizational process read invention, skill investment, and other sorts of changes like that. And, and we've documented this in a series of, of papers going back over a decade now. The result is that if you want to take advantage of these technologies, you have to make investments in intangible assets. And those intangible assets don't show up in our GDP. They may create real assets, but they don't create real output right away um, until they're fully implemented. And uh, we've shown that this leads to what we call a productivity J curve. Um, as you can see with this uh, stylized example, at first productivity falls, maybe for up to 10 or even 20 years, and then later, as the intangible assets are harvested, you see a surge in productivity. And in the paper, we document this for real examples of different economies. And you can see that there's a J-curve effect quite common in many of them. Uh, let me just uh, wrap up by saying that um, we have some good news in terms of, I think, productivity that's going to be coming. Well, tw the 2020s, well, I think, will be an era of a productivity boom. Uh, we have the potential uh, for reskilling work and for better health. Um, but... While digital progress does make the economic pie bigger, there's no guarantee that everyone's going to benefit. There's nothing in any economic textbook or economic theory that says the benefits will be even. It's possible for most of the gains to go to a small group of people, even uh, less than a majority. Uh, most people may be actually be made worse off, even as the overall pie gets bigger. Um, that's not what happened for most of the past two centuries or so in the 1700s, 1800s, and most of the 1900s. But over the past 10 or 20 years, I'm afraid that is what's been happening. We have seen that the gains have gone to a much smaller group than they did historically as uh, digital technologies al allow people to concentrate wealth in a way that they couldn't have before. And our institutions, our laws and our organizations have often reinforced that rather than leading to more widely shared prosperity. So I think the challenge going forward is that uh, thanks to the hard work of a, of a lot of people in tech organizations and computer scientists and others, digital technologies will continue to accelerate, um, but our organizations and institutions are, are lagging. They're not improving exponentially. They're certainly not doubling uh, in power every two years, the way some of our technologies are. Uh, thank you, NVIDIA. Um, so if we wanna prevent a mismatch, we need to work harder on digital transformation so that our, our skills and organizations keep up with these amazing technologies. And so our agenda at the Digital Economy Lab is to reinvent the economy, to understand how to reinvent organizations and to begin that transformation so that we can have not just prosperity, but widely shared prosperity. Um, thanks very much, Juan and I, I'll, I'll stop there and I look forward to your questions and comments uh, later on. Thank you very much, Professor Brynjolfsson. Uh, we have good news and bad news. So uh, good news is that uh, we don't have artificial intelligence in general form, so that we don't need to worry about our Terminator coming up soon. But still, another big uh, bad news is um, digital technologies of the latest years, in fact, are having very serious impact on uh, wealth and other uh, income gaps. Uh, which naturally leads to the third presentation, because uh, uh, this third presentation is about the digital divide, especially on the global scale. So let me just briefly introduce the third speaker, Dr. Nicole Turner-Lee, who is a senior fellow in governance studies and also the director of uh, the Center for uh, Technology Innovation at the Brookings Institution. Uh, her work focuses on uh, digital governance, uh, internet governance issues, including digital futures, AI and ethics, algorithmic bias, and in many issues intersec uh, at the intersection between technology and uh, uh, policy, and also civil human rights. So without further ado, just uh, uh, let's uh, have her just uh, start a presentation. Okay, Dr. Lee, can you go on? Yes. Yes, good evening, everybody, and I'm so happy to be here. Um, I want to echo uh, the kind introduction from our friends with regards to the work that I do. And I feel so out of place because normally I would talk about AI, but tonight I'm going to talk, or this morning I'm going to talk about digital divide. And let me tell you why that is important. I think it's important for us to understand that the pandemic in many ways has disrupted the type of normal wear and tear and daily care that all of us have in our societies. 
We have found ourselves in a state where the public health uh, crisis of COVID-19 has forced us to social distance in ways to mitigate the spread of the virus. And it's no secret that across the world, there have been complications and consequences as a result of this public health crisis, some of which has actually uh, accelerated the digitization in our societies in ways that have generated uh, both fair and unfair results. And I think as we look at, and, and my previous colleagues have actually mentioned, the future of technology, particularly in artificial intelligence, these are actually promising times with regards to what machine learning algorithms as well as autonomous systems can do to accelerate uh, vaccinations, to help in the uh, provision of care, to also help in what I think Korea is trying to do, the acceleration of a contactless society. But at the same token, before the pandemic, in the world, we had very large rates of individuals that were disconnected. Uh, less than one and fewer than four in many underdeveloped countries were actually connected online. And in the United States, according to the Federal Communications Commission, 18 million Americans were without broadband access. And those citizens resided in both rural and urban communities but were predominantly on the scale of being economically um, compromised, so lower income. Uh, they tended to be English speakers and disproportionately people of color and older Americans. And within that group of people, we have seen this tension between what digital technology offers and how we live, we learn, we earn, in some cases we love, and how the lack of access to technology often leads to a state of digital invisibility. Let me put out there just a shameless plug that next year I'll be publishing a book on the US digital divide entitled Digitally Invisible, How the Internet is Creating the New Underclass. And as we have watched the pandemic actually um, accelerate its own self, its own form, it too has contributed to a series of systemic inequalities disparities of who is online and who is not online, and that has consequences. Korea is no exception. As we look at the young people who have been able to return to work through remote learning, who have been able to take advantage of the disruption of technology and the delivery of healthcare, who are now learning and educating themselves via online protocols, that is not the case among Korea's older populations nor is it the case in the United States where people who are over the age of 80 do not have the likelihood of aging in place. And I share all this because as I've actually worked in this space over the last 20 years, and as I've looked at how technology has been a game changer in the future of industries, I'm concerned because the digital divide on the global scale is one that becomes uh, a result, result in social and geographic isolation, increased poverty and the lack of access to wealth, declines in entrepreneurship, and essentially the society of social isolation that many of us on this, in this conversation have never predicted um, in our lives. So what does that mean in terms of moving forward? And I wanna use my time diligently to share, I think my version of a tech new deal. At Brookings, I've been actively working on this issue. And it was really interesting when the invitation came because my tech new deal is a lot different from what we're seeing in Korea, though it is intentioned along the same premise of capturing what we are seeing as the economic outputs and benefits of the use of technology to maintain safety as we navigate through this public health crisis. First and foremost, in my tech new deal, I want to take you back to an era in which I was not born which is the Great Depression in the United States, where there was the need to come up with economic recovery solutions that would allow the United States to both uh, come back in terms of economic self-sufficiency, but at the same time, create new opportunities for displaced workers and others who had no place within society when it came to productivity. We are not too far away from that economic reality. And here in the United States, uh, the pandemic started with about 40 million people filing for unemployment insurance, 100,000 small businesses permanently closed, 
And what we are continuing to see as we determine and weed out those who were flexible and agile in the new digital economy, that many of these businesses will become desolate. But they will be replaced, as we're hearing from other panelists. The question is the extent to which they will be replaced in an accelerated manner. So I will just leave you all with these thoughts before we get into the panel discussion on what is the new tech new deal that I'm proposing. The new tech new deal that I'm proposing is actually an overlay of intersectionality. It starts with the general premise of having infrastructure available at the physical level, meaning whatever that infrastructure may be, fiber, 5G wireless, wireline, that we actually engage in a conversation in the US and globally as to how we accelerate access to digital technologies from a physical perspective so that we do not leave people offline or on the wrong side of digital opportunity. Infrastructure today, as my colleagues have actually also mentioned, is not just about the types of connectivity, the bits, the bytes, or the fiber lines that run, but they also involve data infrastructure and the extent to which we build upon both as the new currency of the internet ecosystem is actually our personal private data, will actually determine the extent to which we start, I think, this road to economic recovery by taking advantage of these assets. Secondly, there has to be people in our countries who are going to build these infrastructures. And just like the New Deal of the earlier times, it's important that we train people on these new automated systems in addition to giving them the skills necessary to build the new next generation roads and bridges. Here in the US, the development of 5G technologies, for example, is slated to develop uh, jobs in the triple digit numbers and return back to the economy livable wage scale jobs, particularly for people who have been out of the workforce or chronically unemployed or displaced by the future of industry. I just was on a panel this morning at Brookings in terms of automation, and these realities will strike those who are the most vulnerable and those who have been less success, least successful in getting out of the consequences or the negative consequences of this pandemic. And then I would say finally with the Tech New Deal, it's important that we also weigh in the options. And this is where I think Korea is lending itself and its expertise in this space as to what the future of industries look like whether they are industries that are contactless, whether they are industries that are based on the artificial intelligence technologies that were discussed, whether they are the future indus industries that have changed the supply chain or how things are made in this country and abroad, it's important that we recognize that those indirect and direct benefits of being in a digital society will actually return on investment into our societies in ways that we've not been able to account for. So what do I mean by all of this in the end? And I'm going to close my remarks here. We have this particular moment of time, this inflection point to actually combine for the first time in human history, the more active production and diffusion of technology. Normally, technologies have been based on a passive consumption model. And as a result, the focus across the world, I believe has been on the commercialization of these technologies and not the extent to which we make them more inclusive, more equitable, and we actually bring in more actors and players to the table to ensure that we're actually using these technologies in ways that advance not just human cognition and decision-making as it's been explained, but also contributing to the very essence of what makes economic recovery possible. In Washington, where I'm based, as we have an incoming administration that will be looking to, for ways to actually prioritize both the existential threats of the economy, healthcare, the pandemic, among other things. It's important that technology is not marginalized to the side, but rather that it is pieced together in a constructive way that actually lends itself to getting out of some of the disparities that have been created through this pandemic and creating a pathway towards economic opportunity in ways that we've not imagined. And so I'll leave it there, but I look forward to the panel discussion because I think where we are right now with the digital divide, it really is telling how quickly a period of 11 months would show how important it is to be connected, 
but at the same time reveal the fact that there are digital deserts that exist across our country that have essentially excluded and made invisible populations of people who require the technology the most to stay connected to the everyday realities of human life. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, thank you also for the remarkable uh, uh, reflection on the digital divide, which actually has been around for many, many years. And it was initially thought as a side effect of uh, uh, the rapid diffusion of digital devices, but now it has, it's becoming a source of uh, huge disparities, essentially generating fundamental gaps in resources and skills and capacities of different groups of uh, people and also countries. Uh, okay, so we're going to have discussion after the last speaker. Uh, although we are running a little bit late. Uh, so the last speaker, Dr. Kamnan Khan, um, is the founder and CEO of Blue Dot, uh, which is now, I guess, I guess, one of the most famous startups in the world because it's the company uh, predicted uh, the spread of COVID-19 for the first time uh, in 2019, uh, late 2019, and it uh, predicted uh, the global spread of COVID-19 in also the world's first peer-reviewed publication. And Dr. Khan is also a professor uh, at the University of Toronto and also practicing actual uh, physician uh, of uh, infectious disease. And I'm really, really glad to introduce Dr. Khan to this panel. Uh, okay, Dr. Khan, can you just start? Sure, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kim, for the kind introduction. And uh, just thank you for inviting me to be a part of the, this discussion. I know we're running a little behind on time, so I will start sharing my screen. I do have a bit of a presentation here, and I hope that you can now see my screen. Um, well, I'm gonna just uh, spend my roughly 10 minutes or so talking a little bit about this global imperative that we, we now face, which is the need to build resilience to epidemic threats. Um, if we've learned anything from COVID-19, it's that epidemic threats and infectious disease threats can appear without notice and can spread incredibly fast. Uh, it's almost in some ways uh, for many of us hard to imagine uh, just how much in, in, a, in a short period of time the entire world has been impacted by a virus that you could fit thousands of them on the head of a pin. And of course, this is not just restricted to COVID-19. If we do look past uh, in, in the past decade, there have been six global public health emergencies declared by the World Health Organization. Uh, COVID-19 obviously being one of them, but it wasn't that long ago that we were facing the Zika epidemic in Latin America that spread to other parts of the world. It wasn't long before that we had the West African Ebola outbreak that then also spread to other parts of the globe. We had we actually had another pandemic only 10 years ago, the H1N1 influenza pandemic. And so this is a bit of an indication that we are experiencing uh, outbreaks with greater frequency, with greater scale, uh, and, and they're becoming more disruptive than they have ever before. Uh, what this ultimately means really for us is that if we are going to stay a step ahead of these types of threats, it means that we're gonna have to move faster and smarter. We have really learned with this pandemic that time is critical. Um, the sooner that you intervene, uh, the more you can change the trajectory and course of an outbreak. Um, so I'm, I'm really pleased to be sharing a little bit about the work that we've been doing at Blue Dot and really, this actually goes back 18 years for me, even long before Blue Dot actually came into being. Um, uh, as Professor Kim mentioned, I'm a, I'm a practicing infectious disease physician. I started my career here in Toronto in uh, 2003. And some of you may remember that in 2003, the first novel coronavirus uh, that we'd ever encountered before, SARS-CoV, uh, emerged and spread around the world and, and showed up here in my uh, hometown of Toronto. Uh, infected colleagues uh, led to the deaths of people in the population uh, and really crippled our city for four months. So you can imagine this is a bit of deja vu for me here. Now we're with SARS-CoV-2 and it does feel a bit like we are in a cycle uh, repeating these types of threats. So we've been building an epidemic intelligence system going back um, 
all the way back to 2003, and then and then Blue Dot was founded 10 years later in 2013. I'm going to briefly talk about three pillars of our, our work. The first is really on early detection of infectious disease threats. Obviously, you can't respond to a threat if you're unaware of it. Um, and the second pillar is really to try and understand, well, what does that threat mean? What is its potential for dispersion and spread? And if it does spread, what kind of impact might it have? Uh, will it trigger another outbreak or will it just remain, um, you know, an illness in one traveler? And then finally, we have all the raw materials we need to be able to disseminate uh, or spread knowledge around the world faster than an outbreak can spread. Uh, and this is ultimately what we're going to need to do in a very interconnected and interdependent world uh, to be able to stay in front of these types of threats. So let me just briefly talk about each of these three pillars um, uh, in, in a fairly, fairly high level here this, this morning. First of all, I want to talk about surveillance and detection of infectious disease threats. Now, what we've been working on is using our data scientists and our data engineers have been working to gather and extract and organize infectious disease data that's reported on what are called notifiable diseases, the diseases, you know, measles and mumps and other types of diseases around the globe and organize and structure this data. But we've also learned that in many instances, there may be outbreaks occurring that are not being reported officially from the public health agencies, either because they're unaware or maybe perhaps there are disincentives to uh, sharing this information early on. And so ultimately, there are opportunities for us to be using uh, some of these unofficial sources of information to, to gather timely uh, knowledge of, of potential outbreaks. So our data scientists have worked with our you know, veterinarians, our physicians, and other health experts uh, to basically build out a series of algorithms that are looking for early signals of outbreaks of everything from plague to um, you know, loss of fever to even syndromes of respiratory illnesses like we saw with COVID-19. Uh, we're doing this in 65 different languages every 15 minutes around the clock and, and scanning for uh, news of outbreaks in, involving over 150 different uh, diseases and, and pathogens. Um, using machine learning and natural language processing, we're able to eliminate information that's of low relevance. Maybe it's something about the heavy metal ban anthrax not being about an actual outbreak or eliminate duplicates of, of uh, the same uh, story that may be reported in different venues. So we're using these types of tools to take vast amounts of unstructured data and organize it and structure it in a way that really exceeds what a human team would be capable of doing this. You know, this is, would not be something you would need a very, very large team of individuals to be able to do this work. And so this really augments uh, human intelligence to, to have that global panoramic view of infectious disease activity. Now, knowing that there's an outbreak there is not enough. We know that these types of pathogens can jump across continents and, and international borders in hours or days. Uh, what we've been building is our GIS and geography uh, experts have been uh, building out spatial models. That blue pin there is the location of the market in Wuhan where the original cases of um, COVID-19 were reported. Using data from hundreds of millions of uh, anonymized locations of mobile phones, uh, as well as other types of GIS models that take into account road networks and you know, physical boundaries, mountain ranges, bodies of water, et cetera, to identify how travelers might move from that location to neighboring airports and what's the probability that they would go to a particular airport. Now, we use these data to then automatically connect into the world's commercial air travel data, looking at almost all of the flight schedules across the planet. You can see this image here are the arcs from the moment when we first picked up uh, news of an unusual cluster of pneumonia cases at the end of December in 2019 to be able to identify, and this was generated within about a second, you know, where are those arcs? Where are the final destinations of, of passengers? These are all anonymized data, but traveling through commercial flights, including all their connections and so forth. So if we just look over into North America as an example, you can see some arcs into places like San Francisco, where the first known death was in Santa Clara County, uh, over into New York City. And then you can see obviously a lot of uh, travelers going to destinations in East Asia. 
Um, and as uh, Professor Kim mentioned, we were quite concerned about this and, and uh, in, in late December, um, you know, in part because it had many echoes of the SARS uh, coronavirus uh, outbreak with the emergence in a, an animal market uh, and being an unusual respiratory illness. We published this study even before it was recognized that <clears throat> this was a, a coronavirus and identified some of the leading cities that we would be concerned about um, this virus showing up in, particularly if we were just seeing the tip of the iceberg. Maybe the outbreak was actually much larger uh, than the official case counts would identify. And these red dots here are beside cities that were hit by COVID-19 and impacted quite early in the course of the outbreak. Bangkok at the top of our list was also the very first city in the world outside of mainland China that uh, had a case of COVID-19. Tokyo was three days later, and you can see that's just uh, up at the top of this list here as well. Now, this is something we submitted back on January 8th. Uh, we did this because we wanted to share some of these results with the rest of the world and have it peer reviewed and open access for uh, anyone to access these types of data. Um, now, it's not enough to track outbreaks or to understand just how airplanes are moving around the world. Every single microbe behaves differently. Zika virus is very different than COVID-19, which is different than loss of fever or measles. Um, and in order to understand what kind of disruption may occur from a microbe, you really need to understand a variety of other factors, demographic factors. You may need to know something about animal populations because many of these microbes actually have uh, come to humans through animal populations, wild animals or livestock. Uh, you may need to know about mosquitoes and other insects that can transmit disease, climate conditions, health systems capacity. And so it's the integration of many of these diverse data sets that allow us to then look at these individual microbes to try and get a sense of what sort of impact they may have. I'm just going to give you one example. This is well before COVID-19 of this study we published in The Lancet uh, in early 2016. This was before Zika had been declared a public health emergency. Um, and so what we used here was looking at the climate conditions, the biology of a mosquito, and having to understand those conditions, how travelers were moving out of areas in Latin America, and recognizing that Zika virus was spread by humans carrying the virus and infecting mosquitoes in the destinations that they went to. What we identified here was that Florida was receiving large volumes of travelers from areas where uh, the virus was likely circulating, had the mosquito present, had uh, the suitable climate conditions. And so this was actually identifying the outbreak that occurred in Florida six months before it occurred. Um, so these are some ways that we can integrate diverse types of data to anticipate how outbreaks will spread. Now, the last piece I, I will just say before concluding here is that one of the real challenges that we face is being able to disseminate knowledge quickly. And the scientific literature is a very important way of disseminating knowledge. But as a professor, I can say it's not always the fastest way, especially when you're dealing with a crisis. Typically, when an outbreak occurs, it's the public health community that first hears about it. Uh, and then Again, as a practicing physician, I can say it's often the healthcare community that hears about this next. And that's problematic because sick patients don't go to the public health department, they show up in the emergency department. And we hope that our frontline healthcare workers will actually be able to recognize a disease that maybe they've never seen or heard of before. Um, but of course, that's not always the case. And that is a, a key vulnerability. The information then typically trickles down to the private sector, to the public, but this sort of waterfall approach is not really the ideal way uh, to be disseminating knowledge. When we say we're all in this together, we ultimately really need a system that can empower different audiences, government and branches of government, uh, the private sector. Uh, so we work, for example, with public health agencies, with uh, departments of defense and security and agriculture. Uh, but with airlines and airports and other private sector organizations that are looking to anticipate disruptions in business continuity, protect their employees and customers, uh, but also hospitals for the reasons that I mentioned before, to empower the triage nurse, to empower the doc in the emergency department, to be thinking about a microbe right at the moment that they need to be aware of it and thinking about it, not just for their own benefit, for their own safety and for the patient's safety, but remember that an astute clinician 
could literally stop an outbreak in its tracks. And a clinician that is unaware and distracted, uh, like many of us are, um, you know, because of the volumes of patients that we're seeing, um, could also be the you know part of uh, of the catalyst for uh, an outbreak that that occurs that that could cripple an entire city. So I'm going to wrap up here and just say, you know, leaving you with this quote from Frank Zappa about information uh, not being knowledge. Uh, and I think the key point I'd like to make here is that going from data to insights is really just part of the way. And ultimately, getting from insight into action really requires partnerships. It requires engagements with a wide array of different organizations in the public sector, in the private sector, in the healthcare sector. And so these types of insights can be integrated into workflows so that when the crisis hits, uh, everyone is ready to, to be able to respond appropriately. And this is ultimately how I think we build the kind of resilience we need, given that this problem of COVID-19, that this will pass too, but, um, but there are unfortunately more of these that will, will lie ahead in our future that we need to be prepared for. So I'd like to just end here and uh, thank you uh, again for inviting me to be a part of this discussion today. Thank you very much, Dr. Khan. Um, it's a fascinating story of detection of infectious diseases. I guess the story of blue dot in detecting uh, all these infectious diseases before uh, the start of uh, uh, epidemic crisis will be remembered as really perpetually fascinating. Um, we have, uh, believe it or not, only 10 minutes left for the discussion. So uh, instead of a free discussion, I guess probably uh, we'll be just asking some specific questions for each panelist. But before uh, doing this round of a discussion, let me introduce our discussion, Dr. Christopher Chang, who is a managing director of Kakao Mobility, which is the leading uh, mobility platform company in uh, this country. Of course, he has a long profile of experience. Again, uh, I recommend viewers just to check our website. He worked at uh, all these famous companies, Hyundai Motor Company, Sam uh, Samsung Electronics, uh, Qualcomm, and uh, NASA JPL as an expert on mobility and energy and other issues. Okay, just the floor is over to you. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kim. Mm -hmm. uh, let me first uh, ask to uh, Mr. Uh, Stryer. Uh, thank you very much for your insightful presentation. So uh, everyone knows NVIDIA has pioneered breakthrough uh, innovations uh, in the computing industry since its uh, invention of G, uh, GeForce 256 uh, back in uh, 1999. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, the, with the silicon chips and uh, software powering uh, AI, uh, more than doubling um, uh, in performance every other year, uh, how do you envision uh, the future of AI-driven innovations? And uh, also, what would be the, the hurdles uh, for realizing it? Uh, can, you, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, I can hear you, but they had forced my mute. <laughs> they just unmuted me. Sorry. Um, uh, uh, so, yeah, of course, I mean, the, the, the trajectory of innovation is incredible and, and it will continue. Uh, you, you know, I, I, I am very, uh, very optimistic uh, of the, how the technology will be applied and, and the role that the industry will play. Uh, you know, I, I, I was really listening intently in some of the earlier presentations about uh, the inequity uh, uh, that's, you know, occurring on our digital frontiers. And, you know, there is a version of that that's playing out specifically in, in the compute world, which is referred to as the compute divide, which, you know, which is the great consolidation of the biggest computers in the wealthiest universities and countries. And I think, that, I think that what we need to do to advance AI and to make sure that it reaches its full potential for society and not just one layer of society, but all layers of society and all countries, not just the wealthiest countries, but even the smallest countries in Southeast Asia and in Africa and Latin America, uh, that it's very important that, you know, that this technology becomes very consumable, very accessible. And, and, and that includes our role is to democratize the infrastructure that makes AI accessible. You can do that by putting it in many different places like in the cloud. Uh, and you can also do it by driving the cost down and making it possible, you know, to, what used to cost 100 million, then cost 10 million, then cost a million, then it cost 100,000. And then, you know, at some point it'll cost 10,000. So the, 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 you know, but, but this combination of innovation will help the industry achieve its goals and, and do it in a very responsible way. Okay. 
Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think it is uh, related to uh, the Dr. Lee's uh, the presentation uh, in somehow. So uh, I cannot emphasize more uh, the, the importance of the inclusivity, uh, the equal opportunity. So uh, this time, let me ask to uh, Dr. Lee. So uh, based on your uh, discussion, what is so unique uh, about the impact of uh, COVID-19 uh, on the global digital divide? So is it uh, the matter of scale or the quality Relatively different impact. So, uh, can you share your insight? Uh, what is the, the uniqueness uh, from uh, the COVID 19, please? Yeah, no, and I we brief. I think that that is such a great question to ask. I mean, I think we've always known that the digital divide has existed, and it's primarily been binary. It's been about who's been online and who is not online, who has a device, who doesn't have a device. COVID-19 has essentially accelerated the rate of digitization in ways that have created new forms of economic devastation. And because that availability of technology has become the floor for what we are seeing with many industries, it has made this, this, uh, this tension between who's online and who's not online a much more glaring and much more disparate in terms of the consequences. And so, Globally, I think because we've all had to do some physical social distancing, it's, it's somewhat determined who has survived, who will survive this and who will not. And I think that's where these income disparities, the disparities that exist among marginalized populations around age, around language, around geographic location become much more exacerbated. I'll, I'll give a great example and then I'll end here. COVID-19 and the digital divide that has actually been amplified as a result of it is actually telling us something about the disparities that exist in education. Here in the United States, for example, 50 million school-age kids were sent home in early March. 15 to 16 million of them did not have digital access, uh, either home broadband or a device. Nine million did not have either. Today, we have young people who have been lost on the registration rolls simply because superintendents and principals cannot find them due to their inability to log on. And to me, that is the devastating impact of what this virus has done to not necessarily bring out the digital divide or at least say that there's a new digital divide, but to amplify the consequences, the consequences mm -hmm. of being disconnected in this new information economy. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is, that is the part that keeps me up at night because globally, we have not been able to solve this simply because we have not come up with a cooperative and collaborative model to make broadband accessible across the world. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lee. Um, and uh, uh, next, I want to ask to uh, Professor Bryn uh, Personally, uh, I like the, uh, the quote by uh, Pablo Picasso uh, that uh, the computers are useless. They can uh, only give you answers. Uh, but uh, recently, uh, when we see the, the example of AlphaGo and other uh, the famous examples, um, they no longer uh, provide just an answer. Uh, this message that we need to race with machine is uh, kind of the critical, yet many of us uh, fear uh, AI winning uh, over humans. So uh, can you please uh, uh, tell us uh, how can we race with uh, rather than uh, fearing to race against the machines? Well, that's a great question and it builds very much on what we just heard from, uh, from Dr. Lee. I just want to briefly mention, we just finished a, a report on how COVID and remote work were changing the US workforce. And what we found was very much what, what, what she was saying. Um, there's been a growing gap. It was already growing, as you saw in my work on, on machine learning. But over the past year, information workers, professional workers, managerial workers have found a much easier time to work remotely, like we are right now. Um, but service workers and manufacturing workers were much more likely to become laid off rather than to continue to work remotely. And as you know, those groups have, tend to have lower wages on average. And so it, it tended to amplify some of the divisions that we'd already seen in society. And I suspect we'd see similar patterns if we looked at other, other nations. Um, so your question is, is spot on. What we need to do is think about how we can use these technologies not to, to amplify these divides and substitute for work, but to amp, uh, improve the ability to work together. And uh, you mentioned AlphaGo. Let me mention another recent breakthrough, AlphaFold, uh, also by DeepMind. 
And this was a tool for helping identify protein folding. And if you talk to the people working with it, it's clear that it's mostly going to amplify human intelligence. It's going to make it easier for scientists and, and, and uh, biologists to find new vaccines, new proteins, new, new solutions to a lot of our problems. The alpha fold is a, is a great tool for amplifying certain types of search, but it works very, very differently than humans. So it doesn't replace what humans are doing. And uh, I would go back to Pablo Picasso's quote that for a long time, uh, for probably for my lifetime and maybe beyond, uh, humans will still be the ones who are important to direct where the technology goes, uh, ask the right questions and use tools like Amphifold. And I would um, implore my technology friends to continue to focus on tools that don't simply replace or mimic what humans are doing. There's too much efforts to sort of beat the Turing test, which is matching what humans currently do, and instead focus on doing something very different from what humans do, uh, like AlphaFold, and therefore create a new set of tools that amplify what we can do. If we f follow that second path, not only do I think we'll make better technological breakthroughs and scientific breakthroughs, I also think we'll have more broadly shared prosperity because as we say, as you said, we will race uh, with the machines, with the machines helping us rather than against us. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I like your, your quote uh, last. Uh, lastly, uh, let me ask to uh, Dr. Khan, uh, so I'm very impressed uh, the, the uh, Blue Dot's story of uh, the COVID-19 detection and uh, the uh, previous examples. Um, and uh, the Blue Dot has uh, built uh, the track record of identifying and tracking the outbreaks of uh, other uh, infectious diseases uh, long before COVID-19, such as Zika and uh, SARS, etc. Um, given the variants of COVID-19, uh, can you please uh, share uh, how can you compare your work on COVID-19 uh, with the experience in other infectious diseases? Any new uh, technologies or techniques or insight introduce the design of AI analytics for COVID-19, please? Well, thank you, first of all, for the question. And I think um, mindful that we're tight on time, so I'll keep my remarks fairly brief. I think what I'll say is that there are certain aspects to epidemics and pandemics where there may be certain common elements, but in, in many instances, they're actually quite different from one another. As you can imagine, COVID-19 and Zika and, and SARS, and et cetera, uh, can be quite different. There are some common elements that I think we have learned over time and started to build up a platform on, which is detection of pathogens and being able to, to really uh, pick up early signals that there may be an outbreak occurring in a certain part of the world, uh, perhaps before it is, it is more widely recognized. Uh, when humans are transporting uh, microbes to different parts of the world, um, you know, we've kind of developed a mechanism for looking at global population mobility so we can anticipate how outbreaks can spread. The challenge really comes about anticipating disruption, because as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, you know, COVID is spread from person to person through the respiratory route. Uh, Zika is spread when, you know, humans transport the virus and infect the mosquito. And if that mosquito lives long enough, it can then infect another person and so forth. Um, so there are many, many um, unique aspects to these different microbes. Infectious diseases, maybe it sounds like this is one uh, homogeneous thing, but of course, it's a very heterogeneous uh, group of microbes. Um, I guess what I would say is just maybe picking up on one of the earlier comments is that this is where we really see the need for um, human intelligence and that you know machine intelligence can be augmenting human intelligence. When we are dealing with a new microbe that humanity has never seen before, we don't have a whole lot of data to actually you know develop machine learning algorithms. Um, we have to actually resort to an understanding of biology and ecology of these microbes and taking subject matter expertise and using human intelligence to complement uh, the tools we have with things like machine learning. So I just thought I would kind of leave on that particular note. This is how we've really built our organization, veterinarians working alongside geographers and physicians and communications experts and, and so forth and data scientists. Uh, and it's that complementary set of skills that are really uh, critical in tackling some of these types of problems with, uh, with newly emerging diseases that humanity has never seen before or encountered before. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there and, and turn it back over to you. 
Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Khan. I really wish uh, this pandemic will be conquered in the near future, but uh, I look forward to your uh, successful uh, story uh, in the near time too. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Chang, leading the discussion. And also, I'd like to thank all our speakers for sharing uh, all these great insights with us. Uh, finally, we are almost coming to the end. Uh, as we know, uh, digital innovations in this time of pandemic crisis are helping us to maintain our everyday life, uh, keeping us safe, and also creating all the apps that keep us safe, and also accelerating drug discovery, and helping uh, vaccine development, therapeutics. So uh, I guess there are so many issues and topics we can discuss uh, forever as to the potentials of digital technologies for uh, especially this uh, increasingly non-contact society. But we have to uh, wrap up this session. So again, thank, everybody, uh, thank you everyone, especially those watching from everywhere online uh, for the privilege, privilege of your time. And also we just hope that everyone just takes care of yourself and also each other. Thank you very much. We will now move on to session two, and it is titled Green Innovation for Sustainable Growth. Now this session structure will be similar to the previous session. We will have four rounds of 10 minute speeches, which will be followed by a 30 minute panel discussion. Now session two will be moderated by Ambassador Hyun Jenny Kim, the Deputy Director General of the Global Green Growth Institute. So please welcome Ambassador Hyun Jenny Kim to the stage. So good morning and good evening to all participants. Uh, my name is Hyun Jenny Kim, as introduced, um, and I am very pleased to, to moderate this session titled Green Innovation for Sustainable Growth, which is very timely and meaningful because particularly Korea has recently announced a serious series of green commitments. In July, the government rolled out its Green New Deal plan. In October, declared net zero by 2050 commitments. And just two days ago, also announced national strategy to implement how to achieve net zero commitment. The year of 2020 is surely dominated by COVID-19 uh, pandemic. The Collins Dictionary picked up the word lockdown as the word of 2020. However, we should not forget natural disasters happened this year as a consequence of climate change. The world is witnessing growing number of mega wildfires and superstorms, which brings about huge damage to people's life and economy. Therefore, both COVID-19 and climate change are global challenges seriously warning from the nature to human beings that we should make transition toward decarbonization and sustainable growth with a strong sense of urgency. Therefore, in this session, we will exchange innovative ideas how to ensure post-COVID-19 recovery more sustainable and greener. The prospect of coronavirus vaccine has boosted hope to end this pandemic probably next year. However, global challenge of climate change still remains with us. Therefore, what innovative actions can we take to achieve carbon-free, pandemic-free future earlier? So we have excellent speakers and panelists who will provide various ideas and perspectives representing different sectors. So, Chairman and CEO Johan Schuel, who is Managing Director and Co-Founder of Next Craft Work, is connected. Hello, Johan. 
Can you hear me? Hello. Yeah. Yes, Good. I can hear it. Good morning. <laughs> Good evening, probably for you. And also, I have Executive Chairman Mark Uday from GreenSync. GreenSync is a global energy technology company. Hello, Mark. Can you hear me? Hello, Hello Mark. Hello, Ambassador. Yes, I can. I can hear you well. Thank you. Great. Thank you for joining. And also, I have Mr. Vivek Pathak, Regional Director for East Asia and the Pacific from IFC World Bank Group. He is online as well. Hello. Hello, Vivek. Hi, Ambassador Kim. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Great. And then finally, as a panelist, I have Professor Lee Jessen, Professor and Jiang Mone Chael from the Division of International Studies at Korea University. He is in person next to, to me. Welcome, Professor Lee. And finally, I would like to mention then Merlin Brown, Chair of the School of Public Policy at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, he will be connected uh, pretty soon. So, uh, let's hear presentations by speakers first. So, I would like to give the floor to Johan first. As far as I understand, you are leading the company of virtual power, power trading and virtual power plant. Therefore, please share your story of green innovation, particularly in energy transition. Over to you. Yes, thank you very much. Please let me share my screen with you. I hope you can see my screen right now. Yes. Perfect. So, um, yeah, a very early good morning from Germany. So it's uh, three o'clock in the morning right now here in Germany and it's pretty quiet around me. So it's in the middle of the night. And uh, waking up in the middle of the night and talking about the biggest challenge of human being in the 21st century, that is um, the climate change right now. So I'm pretty happy for the invitation and talking about that. So thank you very much, first of all. Um, in my presentation, I'm going to talk about nothing else, as I said, as the biggest challenge of, of the human being right now. And this is a major threat. That is what we all know. Um, for us, so um, CO2 emissions are coming up over the years and we are right now facing the climate craze crisis and we already know that we have to do something against this and you already mentioned this in your um, first um, in your first presentation you said um, also Korea right now is going towards a green deal as we also do that in the European Union and Germany. So we are also always and all going towards 100% renewable energies by 2050. And this is going to be a great challenge for us. So how that going to work and how this, um, how, how we going to face this? And um, this is really a good question for us. So right now we are just in the beginning of that journey. So if we look to how much renewable energies we have worldwide as a share of the generated power, we see that we are just at right now 20% to 25%. And we worldwide want to go over 60%. And you mentioned it, we already also want to go to over 90 or 200% renewable energies in some of the countries. And I think this is really needed. This is happening at the same time with a growth of the electricity demand in many countries. So we're going to introduce a lot of more power plants at the same time, replacing all the coal-fired power plants and even also in some countries such as Germany and Belgium as another example, also nuclear power plants. So how this is working, and this is really a good question and an exciting challenge which we have. And I think what we are facing here is really a challenge mostly happening in the first step on the electricity sector. And here also we might have in the, um, on the short run the biggest impact. And this is also why everyone is concentrating on this sector in the first time. And yes, so um, it, it is possible, we can do that by replacing coal-fired power plants and power plants which can immediately or can really follow the demand by intermittent capacity in the end, which is 
sun power, so, so solar power plants and wind power plants. And of course, this is really a challenge. How we can solve that issue that on the one time we want to have electricity when we turn on the light, when we push the button to, to the light, that the light should go on. And at the same time, the wind is generating when the, when the wind is blowing the wind, fire, the wind power plants and the solar power plants are just generating power when the sun is shining. So we need to find a solution how to fill that gap. And this was really one of the ideas or that was a founding idea of Next Kraftwerke. So we said we need to face that challenge and we already started with the idea 10 years earlier and introduced the first virtual power plant in Europe. And this was really the idea to fill that gap and to find a solution to control not any longer thousand power plants, which we used to have in the 1990s years in Germany um, and all over Germany. Right now, we already have more than 1.5 million in Germany. So how can we control them? And this is really the, so the, um, uh, the solution for that is a virtual power plant. So we connect all these decentralized power generators with um, remote control units and connect them centrally to our dispatch center to our virtual power plant. And um, this is really an idea of various technologies. And if you think from a business, techno a business point of view, re you really have to think about um, what flexibility you want to integrate first. And then um, you're, 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 you're facing the merit order of um, flexibilities and thinking about the cheapest flexibility first to integrate. Otherwise, um, yeah, it, it's going to be too expensive for you. And for Germany, we integrated in the first step um, biogas power plants and backup capacities. So today we have a virtual power plant consisting out of 10,000 power plant with an average power of almost one megawatt. So we have almost 10 gigawatt of aggregated power within our power plant and um, almost two gigawatts are engines, um, gas fired, biogas fired engines and backup capacities to provide flexibility for um, for the power market, especially for ancillary services. So um, we, we provide so-called AFR and MFR and FCR capacity. So this is partly, so this is a kind of a flexibility product for the grid operators. Once they have frequency problems in the grid, we offer flexibility and offer a supply of power or even we extract power from the, from the system in, on a short notice, so within 30 seconds, we can react with thousands of power plants within seconds to stabilize the grid. And this is, let's say, one part of the solution which we, um, which we offer. So, so we have a lot more power plants which we are integrating, such as also as the intermittent capacities itself. So we also have integrated a lot of sun and solar power plants and also wind power plants to connect to the market because so also they are not only causing the problem but also are part or should be part of the solution. So um, we can control wind power plants and solar power plants and at the same time and maybe in the first step even more important um, knowing what they are doing and predicting um, very precisely for the, um, for the next day and for the next hours how much power they produce and then maybe react with these assets, so ramp them down if it's, if it's needed, or then also reacting with other um, assets on the market. What is really important for us here is that we introduce kind of a power market, so a liberalized power market, which can then, where we can react on price signals um, that really, um, that we have uh, the possibility that, yeah, innovations are, are allowed. And this is what we see right now in, in Germany and Europe, that power markets are liberalized, going to be more and more liberalized in all these markets, going to be harmonized. This is also very important that we do not have single power markets, but that we can, let's say, match forecast errors in Northern Europe with forecast errors in Southern Europe that there is not, let's say, 
um, single power markets, but one bigger power market. And this is very important for us. Another technology which I, on my last slide, would like to highlight for you is um, a power to gas technology, which is also part of our virtual power plant. And I would say, um, yeah, very significant for the long term um, deviations of uh, demand and supply. So we believe that if we really have um, problems, and we call that in German Dunkelflaute, so that is in the word for we do not have any solar power plants and no wind power plants available at the same time, how we going to match and how we going to fill this gap if this lasts for one or two weeks and we do not have any longer conventional power plants, so facing really the problem of 100% renewable energies. And for this, I think, um, yeah, power to gas is today the solution. This is not on the merit order of flexibilities, not the cheapest flexibility which you could integrate, integrate today, but it is a, a flexibility which is really needed in the mid and long term because we do not have a better technology right now to really store on the longer term um, um, a really big amount of flexibility. And we already have that in our virtual power plant connected. And um, we are starting right now to follow also here the demand with the first power to gas power plants, but still these, are, these power plants are partly supported by the government. Uh, but maybe it's sometimes this is needed to really support um, um, yeah, integration of renewable energies and make 100% renewables possible. I'm really looking forward to have a great discussion with you on, um, on this global challenge. And um, thank you so far very much for, um, 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 yeah, for being with me. Thank you. Thank you, Johan, for sharing your wonderful business story. Um, still, there are people who believe that 100% renewables electri electrification is too ambitious. We have a long way to go, but just from your presentation, I can feel that we have enough technology to achieve 100% renewables. So thank you very much for sharing the story. And next, I'd like to invite another uh, speaker representing private sector. So Mark, uh, Mr. Mark Udal from GreenSync. Mark. As an entrepreneur, investor, and leader in energy transition, please share your success story uh, through your business. Over to you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Let's hopefully have this come up. Hopefully everyone can see the screen. Well, uh, many thanks to the organizers of this interesting conference for inviting me to speak on Green Innovation for Sustainable Growth. I'm delighted to be part of this panel and to have a very good discussion uh, after we've made our presentations. I'm gonna to speak to you today about a similar subject uh, to that of Jochen, but it's the next evolution of that. And my initial comments are going to be focused around what is happening here in Australia. I'm speaking to you from Sydney. Australia is without doubt the canary in the coal mine, if you would pardon the pun. We have here in Australia the greatest distribution of rooftop solar in the world by a significant margin. In some of our Australian states, the percentage of houses that now have distributed energy, solar and batteries, is in excess of 40% of all dwellings. Now, that is in some ways fantastic, um, but it does cause some problems, which we'll talk about in a moment. But it's not stopping at 40%. We are continuing to expand, even in those high penetration states, as well as other states that are maybe at 30 or 20% penetration. The country as a whole is at 27% penetration of solar on roofs. And by 2030, in excess of 40% of electrical capacity will be behind the meter here in Australia, the highest in the world by far. That distributed energy consists mostly of solar and batteries, but increasingly will also include electric vehicles and other controllable devices. So how do you manage a 
electricity system uh, with that high level of distributed assets behind the meter. We're already seeing some of the problems of that. There have been a number of extreme events in South Australia, as well as in Victoria, where the grid has not been able to respond to events in a way in which the traditional grid of a centrally managed grid would have probably done. So we have to come up with new systems, and this is going to become ever more apparent as the duck curve, something some of us may be familiar with, but it is a graphical interpretation of what happens to power demand during the day from the central system versus power that is generated at the local distribution network from the DERs on people's roofs. In South Australia, that is going close to zero in the middle of the day. In other words, there is hardly any need in the middle of the day for centrally generated electricity. In fact, there was an hour last month where the whole of South Australian demand was provided from solar, not from other forms, including wind, just from solar. And 70% of that supply came from rooftops. So we are seeing today the kinds of events that will become more apparent in other parts of the world. So Australia is having to think ahead and introduce new mechanisms to cope with the ever-increasing DERs on our rooftops. In order to do that control, certain parts of the country are introducing a compliance program. That compliance program will ensure that all new DERs are controllable by the market operator via the local distribution network. And that is a big red button. It's effectively a way for the market operator to control the resilience of the grid at extreme points of activity or inactivity. We have, for example, in parts of Australia, in the spring and in the autumn, negative pricing on our grid during the middle of the day to try and address this problem. And that negative pricing can go as high as $1,000 per megawatt hour negative. So people are getting paid to effectively turn off their equipment. But in order to do that, in order to have that controllability, you first of all need to see the assets, to have the visibility of those assets, to know where they are, what they're likely to do in different types of situation, what they can do, and who can do it. And then in a particular situation, you need to be able to control that asset. Now, I'm speaking from a compliance perspective, but the control can also be for VPPs, like Joachim was telling us about, that can respond to either wholesale price opportunities or grid resilient services like FCAS. And most importantly, you need to know what happened. Did those particular devices respond to an event? Did they respond quickly? Did they respond throughout the event, uh, etc.? At GreenSync, we have developed a product called DEX, the Distributed Energy Exchange. We are an Australian business located in Melbourne, and we have been supported and funded by a number of Australian government agencies because this is a very important part of managing the Australian response to the high growth of renewables. In itself, a very good thing, but not without some challenges. What DEX does is it interfaces with all of the OEM vendors, the people who sell uh, the technology that enables your rooftop solar, your battery to work. Typically, those are the inverter companies. There'll be some very familiar names to people here in the audience. And we create a cloud-based API integration. There's no need for any physical hardware in any home to have that device controllable. We then link to three counterparts through our digital network. 
we link to the VPPs, who are typically here retailers, electricity retailers, who are looking to serve their customers and enable those customers not just to be controlled, but also to benefit from some of those opportunities. We link to the local network, for example, in South Australia, that would be South Australian Power Networks, to give them the visibility of what is happening on the network. And we link to the market operator, in this case, AEMO, the regulator here in Australia, who has the control of the big red button, but also would like to have visibility. And all of this is done in the cloud. We are able to manage hundreds of thousands of devices on this system. And we'll be able to roll this system not just out in South Australia, but in other states in Australia as and when they introduce compliance programs, which are expected sometime in 2021. But this is not just an Australian issue. We are going to have to look to manage DERs as they grow in many other countries, in Germany, in the UK, in Japan, in North America, in Korea. They are growing because solar is becoming the cheapest form of generation. The price of batteries to give an extension to that solar capability are also coming down fast. And the transition from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles is also going to drive up an ever-increasing amount of electrical generation and demand behind the meter. So this is going to take place around the world. What is very important is that this doesn't inhibit the growth of renewables. That's too important for us to achieve our climate objectives. So we have to enable a market-based system that easily can be rolled out in multiple jurisdictions. From a DEX perspective, we can talk to any asset in any part of the world at any time. So we are totally technologically agnostic. So what we do for people is we provide the right control and the right opportunity so that all members, all participants of the DER value chain, the end user customer, the installers, the OEM vendors, the VPP aggregators and the networks and the market operators, everyone is benefiting from a digitally connected platform that provides that visibility, that control and that verification. Thank you very much indeed, Ambassador. Thank you, Mark, for sharing your story. Because we are a little bit behind of the schedule, so I'd like to invite Vivek from IFC uh, directly. So Vivek, uh, as far as I understand, IFC is one of the major investors for green project globally. And please share what IFC is doing, particularly to help developing countries and emer emerging economies in COVID-19 recovery. And thank you very much to GIGF for inviting me for this. Uh, I think both Mark and uh, uh, Yukon have given some excellent presentations uh, and sort of very detailed on terms of what's happening in terms of innovations. Uh, what I will try and do is really get a little sort of more 39,000 foot view on what's happening and what we can do. So first and foremost, I think uh, it's important to recognize that uh, climate is here to stay. I think there's no two ways in that. And the business case for investing in climate has really never been stronger. And the reason I say that is over the years, there's always been, what are we really doing in climate? Is it financially viable? Is it sustainable? Or does it need a lot of subsidies? And the reason I say that is because we need to move away from actually treating climate or its solutions as sort of CSR or philanthropy and try and make it a lot more mainstream. So that's what I'll try and say. And I personally believe that if it doesn't make business sense and if it doesn't make financial sense, there should be other people who are doing it and there's a lot of money which can go in there. And a big frustration over the years for people like me have been the entire disruptive technology space attracted billions and billions of dollars, whereas some very good climate solutions at the same time, I think were being starved for capital. But fortunately that's changed. I think people recognize the importance and people have recognized very clearly that there is money to be made in climate. And I'm hoping that will result in a lot more capital flowing into the space. So
yeah. So how much money is needed uh, for this entire space? Uh, I, I think uh, had it not been for COVID-19, the numbers that have been given to me are the, between now and 2030, uh, we would need, I think, close to $28 billion in long-term finance for, in, for, for the infrastructure space. But another space which needs a lot of capital really is the entire city space or the construction industry, because they're saying that about two and a half billion people will migrate or will be added to cities between now and 2050. And, a, and almost, I think, 70 or 80 percent of them will be in Africa and in Asia. So clearly a huge opportunity there for us to collectively build this, all these new cities or sort of the new construction that happens in a climate friendly manner. And there is really, the, the, we have a great tool called Edge, uh, which is basically a green building tool for emerging markets. And we really hope that even if, you know, 80% of it can be built, I believe it should be 100%. Yeah. Now, when you try and do green buildings, the first question I get from my clients is, is it more expensive? And I said, yes, it's more expensive. And then you have to make a business case of why should you do it? And the business case is very clear for people like us, is a green building, will have a lot more value than a brown building five years from now. So do you want to construct an asset which is going to be lower in value or invest a little more? And the good news also is that payback periods for green buildings have been coming down. I think payback periods for green buildings, which used to be four or five years, depending on the country, the location, the payback periods are now down to two to three years. So it really makes business sense. In fact, I, I just think it's bad business sense in my view to do what I call brown buildings. So th that's clearly one area where I think that we can be doing a lot more and we should. Yeah. Now, when you also look at the current landscape, you know, when you look at the buildings around you, most of them are old buildings. And at least in Asia, where I live and I cover, buildings are not, you know, you don't bring, bring down a building and reconstruct it every 10 to 12 years. In a lot of our countries, you know, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, India, buildings stay on for 15, 20, 30, 40 years. Now a building that was constructed 25, 30 years ago, it's probably a huge source of uh, greenhouse gas emissions directly or indirectly in the amount of energy they consume, use of the water, how they manage their waste, so on and so forth. So the other opportunity, huge opportunity out there is how do we decarbonize some of these existing assets? And uh, we recently did a loan to a company in Thailand called Asset World Corp, uh, which is a part of a very big conglomerate, uh, Kun Charon's conglomerate. And they're, I think, amongst the largest real estate and tourism companies in Thailand. And our thinking was, in addition to ensuring that all their new construction is green, we would like to work with them to decarbonize their existing assets. So when they're retrofitting or when they're sort of uh, repairing an existing asset, how do you make it green? So it's something we've started, but I do hope this will take off in Asia because I think this is another really big opportunity for us. Now, clearly two or three things that we need to focus on, Asia being the largest emitter of greenhouse gases, the responsibility is a lot more on us in Asia on what we do. Uh, even if we can argue that a lot of the products that we produce in Asia are consumed by other continents. Nevertheless, so I would say that, uh, you know, like I said earlier, the, um, the needs are huge and that should hopefully attract a lot of the private equity firms and the banks and the, and the institutional investors. The needs are huge. Like I said, you know, uh, the amount we need for climate far surpasses, I think, what is available today. So how do we really get that? So, Three, four things is what I'd like to talk about is, one is a few of the new opportunities that are emerging. Second is, how can we de-risk them? And third is, who are the new sources of investors? So let me start from the last. There's a lot of need today. Uh, the challenge I think we all face is, there are no real standards. You know, there are so many different green bond standards across the world. Countries have their own standards. The ASEAN has their own standards. Uh, uh, the EU has, the, you know, everybody's got different standards. So one of the things I think we should really be focusing on is what constitutes a green bond and try and ensure that that's consistent across markets. What constitutes a blue bond? That's something we're very keen to work on uh, because it's a blue economy, which I'll talk about in a minute. What constitutes a green loan or a blue loan? What constitutes green equity? So I think a lot of work needs to be done on that, on how do we have common taxonomy 
and harmonizing standards. And I think I'll just deviate a minute, but harmonization of standards is even more critical now when different countries are still struggling with what's the right vaccine, what's the right test for COVID. You know, different countries have different tests available. And that causes a lot of confusion to the average person like me who might want to try and travel one day at some point in time. So that's one thing I think that we can collectively work on with the different institutions. I'll, I'll also talk about uh, sort of two other big emerging areas. One is I talked about green buildings uh, and sort of the city space which will emerge. The second is the blue economy. And the blue economy, we don't realize, but uh, you know, it's easy for us to see pollution in the air and see we're breathing it. And we understand that's not good for us. Yeah. But the blue economy is actually putting poison into our food chains, is putting poison into water. And unfortunately, we're not able to see it there because as we all know that plastic waste from rivers eventually gets into the seas, into the oceans. Once it gets into the oceans, it gets into fish, it gets into plant life, it gets into water, and all that then eventually comes back into our ecosystem, which is our own bodies. Yeah. And that's something I've really, I've taken a very sort of personal view on and very passionate about. So the entire blue economy, then it also you have the fisheries, which are impacted by that. There are almost 60 million people who work in fisheries and aquaculture. And seafood is important for almost 3 billion people around the world. So, you know, the, I'm told the number that the oceans are contributing to the global economy are about one and a half trillion. And that amount will probably double by 2030, according to the OECD. And about 8 billion tons of plastic are dumped into the ocean every year. So we really need to work on that. And there are different ways. One is clearly more recycling. So we recently worked with a client of ours in Thailand, Indorama Ventures, they provided them $300 million for recycling PET. They're the largest producer of PET. So for using, for recycling that, so that's one way. But we also need to try and see, and personally, if I go somewhere and it's something is served to me in a plastic straw, I just take out my own metallic straw. So we all have to do a lot on our own, but reduce the use of plastics and where you cannot sort of manage, you can, cannot recycle or reduce, we also need to then figure out a way on how do we manage the waste. You can't let the waste be going into rivers and getting into the oceans. So clearly a lot needs to be done because as we've seen, the impact plastics can have on, on our health and biodiversity is huge. And the price to pay for that will be immense as we go along here. Uh, the, the sort of the, the other change is, the other challenge really, I'll be very brief on this, is sustainable infrastructure. Uh, I think in Asia, we keep talking about it according to the ADB, the gap between now and between 2017 and 2030 was about 26 trillion and about half of that, almost half of that in power and the rest in water, transport, telecoms. But that need, that need is still there and we're falling behind on that. And I think there also we need to come up with more bankable projects or pools of capital that can help us de-risk some of these projects. But what's going to be absolutely critical going forward is that this infrastructure is not built based on old standards. This infrastructure should be climate resilient, should be green. Otherwise, it's going to be money down the tube as far as I'm concerned. So let me conclude by saying a lot needs to be done. Uh, this is a space where we need help from everybody, all the stakeholders. It's just not the private sector. The, we need governments, we need the private sector, we need the public sector, and most importantly, we need the common man to understand. The stakeholder, the, the common man is probably getting the most impacted, and we need him or her to understand if they don't change their behavior, and if they don't increase their demands on how these things are being managed. Ultimately, they're the ones and their kids are gonna suffer a lot there. So with that, I thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Vivek, for sharing your comprehensive uh, views regarding prioritization for innovative, sustainable growth. Um, Dr. Marilyn Brown from Georgia Institute of Technology is connected. Therefore, Marilyn, very good to see you. I think you are ready for your presentation. Over to you. Right. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. This evening or in your time zone this morning. I apologize I joined late because I thought it was tomorrow and not today, but I am totally prepared and excited to be part of the Global Green Growth Institute's event tonight. And thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel on the green innovation for sustainable growth. Just as context, we all know that the 
temperatures across the globe are warming, and this year has been a particularly difficult one already in the United States with forest fires and hurricanes, rising sea levels, uh, drought and flooding and uh, more. So we are needing to come to grips with the climate challenge. We all know that human activities, especially the emissions of greenhouse gases are the dominant cause of these events. Uh, meeting the global challenge of two degrees C above industrialized uh, temperatures uh, is going to be, uh, is going to require rapid action across the globe. We all look to the Paris Accord. I'm so pleased that President-elect Biden has committed to rejoining the Paris Agreement, which I call the first pivot here in this diagram from the IEA. But the first pivot, of course, is only the beginning of the march downwards and the bending of the curve that we all are going to need to achieve together in a communal commitment to tackle global warming. Um, globally, the power sector is leading the way. And I've been hearing a lot of that in this session's uh, discussion so far, leading the way toward decentralizing our energy sector. Um, across the globe from the statistics here from the REN21 latest global status report, you can see that wind power, solar, biopower, and geothermal are growing as renewable electricity resources in addition to hydropower. Of course, you know in that set of renewables, we have several of them that are intermittent and difficult and challenging to manage, to orchestrate on the electric grid. It was much easier when it was hydropower and biopower and geothermal because they're dispatchable. But now we're turning to the much more sustainable, the cleaner, but the more challenging intermittent resources, wind and solar uh, photovoltaics at 6% and uh, at 3% of our current electricity generation globally. Um, solar photovoltaics in particular are dominating the renewable power additions lately. Globally, you can see here the rise of solar photovoltaics, mostly utility scale uh, solar, but also rooftop solar and, and distributed solar. At first, uh, 2015 um, or so, Marilyn, we saw the mark. Marilyn, I'm yes. sorry for interrupting you, but I don't think actually you share your slide with us. Oh, oh wow, my now it's oh, coming, right. great. Yes, please go on. Please go ahead. Are now we can look, yes, the slide is on the screen now. All right, so sorry about that. Um, I guess I won't go back, I'll just go forward. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we see here the, um, the strong surge of investment in solar photovoltaics. So moving forward in the United States, that's also occurring. So here's the US picture for electricity generation over the past uh, 10 years and the forecast by the Energy Information Administration out to mid-century 2050. So you can see here renewables are growing rapidly the green segment, 19% today, and expected to go to 38% um, by 2050. As you decompose that renewables wedge, again, you can see solar power taking a prominent role uh, in the growth of the US renewables from 15% to 46%. So how are we going to manage that? Well, one way we're going to make this um, a resilient and dependable, reliable grid with so much renewables is through actions of consumers. So we now have um, the opportunity to distribute smart meters with two-way communications across all of the um, segments of the, uh, the economy. Of course, started off a while ago, 10, 20 years ago, with smart meters and industry and large-scale commercial 
uh, buildings, but now we have it penetrating into smaller uh, residential and you know, single family uh, units and in multifamily uh, complexes as well. So the uh, two-way communications offer powerful ways to um, address consumption in response to the needs of the grid through real-time electricity pricing, that's Wi-Fi enabled, uh, controlled from computers and from our own cell phones and interfaced with in-home and in-office and smartphone displays. Uh, this is a, a case where we are not just, not just managing our consumption, but we're also managing the services that our energy is delivering, such as the comfort um, and the uh, services of our, within our buildings. I did an analysis a couple of years ago of the cost competitiveness of renewables in the United States relative to fossil fuel um, uh, alternatives. And you can see going from left to right, as you move up the curve, using a measure called the levelized cost of new electricity, that onshore wind, utility scale solar, and natural gas are just about going head to head, however you measure them in terms of their uh, competitiveness for delivering that next uh, megawatt of electricity. And on the right, you have biomass, coal, nuclear, all receding into much uh, a less competitive um, zones. Across the entire um, array here, I've superimposed the measure of how much you can get and what it costs to save electricity. So the green band is the band of energy efficiency and it indeed outcompetes all of the supply options. So by far the best investment, if you wanna to try to manage your energy resources is to be more efficient about how you use them. So now we have a very complex energy ecosystem with these distributed resources in terms of new uh, in intermittent renewables, microgrids, um, and uh, other types of uh, generation superimposed on a man ways that we can manage our demand through microgrids, dis with distributed storage, through energy efficiency investments. And one of my favorites is demand response. So here we have um, messages being sent by the utility operator indicating when there is a particular need for demand to be reduced. And so demand response will pay for consumers to manage their consumption and to be rewarded through price signals. Transport is there too. You see that little electric car. So that car is going to have its uh, recharging managed through smart systems as well. Not only is it going to be consuming at smart times, but it may also be uh, providing ancillary services to the grid. It provides, can provide storage and frequency regulation, voltage control, and can be part of the solution as well. So the future is going to be this type of a, a more distributed energy ecosystem with many different um, types of consumption and efficiency and demand side responses. It's happening. We're seeing in the United States, a shift to distributed resources. We've got a lot of gigawatts of solar capacity, meaning rooftop solar. We have uh, millions of electric customers already supplying power back to the grid, mostly from renewables. We have uh, wholesale and utility demand response programs where customers are electing to participate to um, to accept time varying rates for their consumption, to be able to um, respond when, when the utility is faced with high, high costs. And we have quite a bit of combined heat and power. In fact, this is the largest distributed 
resource at the moment in, in uh, the US, which is where mostly industrial users not only um, um, consume energy for man managing their industrial um, operations, such as pulp and paper mills, but then they also use the waste heat to generate electricity and on site are able to essentially provide power uh, free of charge and at uh, no, essentially no, with no um, pollution. So the last example, of course, is uh, electricity, electric vehicles with charging cycles that are now being managed. So here's a picture of what our grid uh, is moving toward with so many distributed resources on it. Very challenging to manage it, but a much cleaner, uh, low carbon uh, system of, of uh, electricity where we're merging our transportation and our uh, power uh, needs into a system that's mutually advantageous. You know, the cleaner the electricity, the cleaner are our electric vehicles. It doesn't make any sense to run electric vehicles on coal-based um, electricity. Once you've moved to renewables, electricity-driven vehicles are essentially um, pollution-free. So a vision of the future is, uh, you know, we've got the technologies uh, in place. They're known. They're, we can operate them, but we don't have the business models, and we certainly don't have all the policies in place that are needed to develop the full potential of these technologies. We need new um, business uh, uh, aggregators, new, new entities set up to to try to pull together the distributed uh, demand of multiple consumers and prosumers offering uh, grid based, offering their electricity back to the grid and storing it and being able to be a source of re resilience as well. Uh, prosumers will be key to the green innovation uh, movement. They're becoming, uh, consumers are becoming producers, uh, they're prosumers. This is all facilitated by the falling cost of solar panels. We've got home battery systems uh, dropping rapidly in, in price. And of course, many, many more electric vehicle models available. Um, and there uh, is a growing array of charging infrastructure that can make use of these. So the technologies are very promising, um, and now we just need to get those policies and business models in place to fully deploy them. So um, now is the time to be a first mover in clean energy. This is true for our governments and for our business sector. And I look forward to uh, talking about this some more during our time on the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, four speakers, for your very visionary, however, very practical, innovative solutions. So we are going to start our panel discussion. At first, I would like to invite Professor Lee Jessen, uh, because you have involved in energy transition, sustainable development area for long years. I think you have many comments to our previous speakers or questions or something to add. So Professor Lee, over to you. How, how many, uh, we, we, we are actually under, under, under a very tight time constraint. So yes, how, how I mean, many? if you can finish within five minutes, it will be very appreciated. <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm not sure whether we will have a lot of interaction uh, and question and answers. So I will combine my comments and questions together and pass the ball to, to, back to you. Okay, and I, uh, I did enjoy the, the four presentation and they were very uh, insightful and also reflecting a lot of innovative uh, initiative. And, but well, somehow I heard an, an overarching theme. I, I just, the, uh, the catching, I'm just catching up the, uh, a theme of uh, the green ecosystem, green business ecosystem and green policy ecosystem. So that would be probably the, the key uh, running 
through the key theme running through these the four presentations. And I found uh, three uh, presentations. Three uh, presentations are, are focusing on the brain side, brain side of green innovation and brain side of, of the uh, uh, low carbon and renewable energy, which would be the prosumers and digital solution, virtual power plant. They are all also made, well, somehow dealing with the smart grid and, and the grid intelligence that will uh, set the proper demand and, and supply. And, uh, and our, the, uh, and, uh, the Vivex presentation focused on, on our cardiovascular system, which is the, the blood, and, and blood is money. It's the financing, it's how to enhance green financing. Uh, so, uh, well, I'm, I'm very happy, I'm very happy to see that our discussion is moving. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis a couple of years ago, we've been talking about, the, uh, the, we, we, we have to do this, we have to do this, and, and solar, wind, but we are kind of moving toward the next generation. We are talking about the intelligence, we are talking about the brain, nerve system, and cardiovascular system uh, of the green ecosystem. So, I think uh, we are truly in a way uh, to advance our uh, initiative and big move toward the carbon neutral. Uh, but may maybe one brief comment per each for, 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 for time proposed. Uh, first, uh, in, in a reverse order, for, uh, for Marilyn, was I, I, I did enjoy your, your well kind of summarized the, uh, the presentation. And uh, yes, I, I do agree that uh, the prosumer is, is, is becoming more and more important. But uh, maybe at some point, maybe at some point, uh, we should decide, yes, well, there can be a different kinds of prosumer. So, and residential sector, industrial sector, and also their size. So how to, how to differentiate and how to integrate the, this different uh, the prosumer uh, would be the key challenge for grid integration and uh, grid, grid intelligence. And for Johan's uh, uh, the presentation was the, uh, yes well, for for an um, for an ambitious target of, of carbon neutrality and, and I um, like your ideas your, your initiative of virtual power plan and of course that will reflect the, the German energy vendor the uh, long. Uh, experience of, of, of energy transition. But uh, oftentimes I, I'm thinking that uh, in the, indeed the carbon neutrality is, is good, but oftentimes when we are focusing too much on the target itself, and, and we may miss some kind of hidden, hidden carbon footprint or sometimes water footprint. So that will be one, one uh, the, the policy the, the challenge, but, uh, but actually the, the virtual power plant idea should be based on, on a perfect kind of market liberalization, grid integration, r regulatory harmonization, which, which are going on in Europe nowadays, but actually the, uh, the, especially in terms of price setting, uh, that would be, that would need a lot more communication between utility company, the government regulatory agency, and, and the actual kind of a technology company uh, like yourself. And uh, the, on, on the mark, uh, yes, indeed, certainly uh, the digital solution is, is extremely important and have to provide a constant comp well, the, the signals and, and, and order the compliance system. But I'm, I'm, I'm curious how, how the, uh, this kind of a well, the, uh, the, the inverter-based uh, control system uh, can be connected with, with energy storage the, uh, system, ESS, and also in, in, give, in, in drawing a compliance from the participant, the, the small producers, um, either kind of price incentive or other kind of the policy incentive uh, might, be, might need to be uh, supplemented. And, and, and lastly, for, for, for Vivek, yes, indeed, the cardiovascular, the, the blood is running. 
And there are a couple of agencies, like well, certainly World Bank, but GGGI, GCF, and ADB, they are working on, on this kind of project. And, and well, so I'm, I'm the, uh, I'm, uh, well, so my idea, the comment slash question is, how to ensure a sound governance especially in developing countries, in, in enhancing this kind of, of green financing, because uh, the green building and standardization, blue economy, that's certainly, well, that's super idea, but that certainly need a lot of caution and, and, and different responses uh, depending on different levels of, of their, their the capability, capacities, and, and also commitment. So upon that note, I will pass the ball to Jenny. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lee. So uh, I think speakers, you must have responses to the comments and questions raised by Professor Lee. So first of all, I'd like to invite Vivek uh, if you can respond to the questions regarding particularly sound governance in green financing uh, by the Professor Lee. Just if you just finish within one minute, it would be very appreciated. Sure. So I, th I think thank you so much, Professor Lee. And uh, uh, clearly, this is a big challenge today is how do we have sound governance and harmonized standards? And how do we ensure that green washing or blue, blue washing or impact washing is, is not taking place? And, and I don't think this is the solution is not going to come from one institution or another. This has to be a group effort. And uh, just to share with you all that starting January, I'll be moving to a new position uh, with IFC as our global head of climate and sustainability. And that's one of the things I really want to take on there is to work with institutions or uh, groups like the G20, the G7, the World Economic Forum and different other, the BIS, and really come up with standardized guidelines. Uh, we can have different standards. We can give people time to reach certain standards. You can't expect everyone to be at a gold-plated standard from day one, but we absolutely need standards that are comparable. Otherwise, investors start getting confused. When investors start getting infused, they do not put money where they should be putting it. So I think it's paramount, and I would love to have a side conversation with y'all at GGIF to see how y'all can support this initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vibek. And Mark, I think you have answers to the question raised by Professor Lee. You are mute. Please unmute. Hopefully you can hear me now. So very quickly, Professor, thank you for your questions. Um, from a technical perspective, these are integrations that happen through the API of a OEM vendor to the API of the DEX platform. So everything is done in the cloud. There's no requirement for a physical uh, connection or physical piece of equipment. Um, so that enables a very scalable uh, and affordable uh, implementation of this type of technology. The second question, which I think is fundamental, is how do you incentivize users? And it has to be a carrot and a stick. So in Australia now, there is a compliance requirement, um, but also that comes with benefits. If you comply, instead of being limited at a much smaller amount of exports, say two kilowatts for 100% of the time, a homeowner can have five kilowatts for 95% of the time, and only in those extreme conditions is their capacity to export reduced below that two kilowatts. So that is the effect of uh, carrot or benefit to uh, people who respond. I think there's a very important point that Marilyn brought up, but I, I'd like to maybe test it, which is, yes, it's important we have prosumers, but actually if this doesn't work for everybody, it won't work. It has to be easy. It has to be automatic. It has to happen in the background. And it, it's not, I don't think, about people looking at their smartphone to see when is a, a time to run their dishwasher. That's not scalable. What will be scalable is the people who are in this day-to-day, -day, the retailers, will provide economic incentives to take control of people's assets at very important times of the day. And they will give an economic benefit to that individual of, 100 or 150 dollars a year to say for those few hours of the year i want to control your battery or your solar it will not be done by people looking at their smartphone thank you mark 
now I move. I would like to move to Johan. Uh, yes, uh, as Professor Lee uh, mentioned, actually a lot of integrated efforts and collaboration must be necessary in order to make virtual power plant work, as you presented. So you must have uh, your responses to Professor Lee. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you very much, Professor Lee, for your good questions. I can just link my answer to what just Mark mentioned to is really um, a consumer, a household consumer reacting on price signals and putting their washing machine on. This is, in, in, in the end, the question of what is the best flexibility to use at what point in time. We have so much opportunities. And my answer to your question, Professor Lee, would be we need to have a competition of opportunities. So an opportunity competition of flexibilities. And um, therefore, we need a market. We have so much opportunities to use to integrate renewable energies and therefore to boil down that flexibility towards um, a possible where we can react on, we need to have price signals and markets which bring these price signals towards the household customers, maybe but in the first step to industrial customers who can react and provide flexibility in the first step a lot easier. I think the first 25% of renewable energies, that was quite easy to integrate with still 75% uh, of, um, of, of power provided by conventional power plants bringing the flexibility into the market. The next 25 or up to 100% renewables, this will be the real challenge which we are facing and therefore we need open markets. We are facing more than millions of, um, of uh, producers in just a small market as Germany. And so we need to kind of control all of these. And this is best done by a market. A market provides also the opportunity for new innovations, such as virtual power plants. And so innovations then bring the solution. Because Marilyn are right, is right, we have te the technologies in place. Right now is really the question of how to best use these technologies and how to reduce the cost. And my petitum was, would be, let's do it with a clear and open liberalized market approach in all the countries of the world. And then um, we, we find the best solution for that. Thank you. Thank you, Johan. And finally, I would like to invite uh, Marilyn uh, in responding to the question by Professor Lee. Marilyn? Over to you. Marlene, I think you are mute. Please unmute yourself. Now am I, am I okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, Professor Lee, I liked how you started off by saying in terms of prosumers, we need to consider different uh, portions of the marketplace. And in, in fact, prosumers... Uh, in industry have been around for a long time and have managed markets and developed uh, uh, services uh, that they've been able to offer to utilities. But as you move down toward the uh, more discreet and difficult to coordinate uh, scales of residential customers and even individual electric vehicle owners, you need different models. So that's where that new business um, uh, intermediary market uh, aggregators uh, notion comes from. Uh, Mark, you are absolutely right, Mark Woodall, that um, I think that load control, <laughs> direct load control is just so much more effective than sending a market signal and hoping that the consumer has the right kind of price elasticity of demand to deliver what you need as a, as a utility uh, manager. However, um, it seems that the uh, preferred um, mode is to, to launch that price signal. It's a very crass, a very coarse kind of uh, policy. And I, I hope that we'll be able to move toward more direct control to be able to deliver known um, you know, services at exacting points in time. Um, yeah, I think that we're, we're seeing the emergence of um, 
uh, Jochen, lots of uh, new new uh, opportunities in the in the open marketplace, and that's what we need to be able to do. We need to be able to bid in our our uh, resources. In the United States, if you want to bid in to deliver, um, let's say I had mentioned uh, frequency regulation from your electric vehicle, and you uh, you try to uh, plug it in and, and um, sell your uh, services to the utility, well, you're immediately going to um, void your car warranty. <laughs> you know? So very little simple things like that. Uh, that's not really governance. That's just some kind of a you know, business uh, decision that has got to be negotiated to be more compatible with the kind of future that we know we need. So lots of challenges, but I also still hold by my guns that I think the technology is there and we just have to figure out how to best put it to you. So thank you so much. Great. Vivek, I really enjoyed your comments as well, especially in the demand side and buildings and you know, all that we can do there. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, thank you, speakers and panelists for active uh, participation of this discussion and also we exchanged a lot of innovative ideas. Therefore, we all share the view that technology is in place, we have money. The, the, the key is how to make market function well with technologies and with money and how to ensure good governance and strong political will to go ahead for the decarbonization. Uh, because of time limit, I think I have to uh, bring this meeting to the end. But thank you very much for joining from the United States, from Germany, from Australia. Uh, and I hope all of you stay in good health and have a good day. Good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, we will wrap up day one of the Global Innovative Growth Forum 2020. Once again, thank you very much to all participants, including speakers, presenters, moderators, and panelists, and of course, our audiences around the world for joining us. We hope the forum has been useful and that it has provided you with valuable new insight. Now, tomorrow for day two of GIGF 2020, we will commence at 9 a.m. Korean Standard Time. During session three, we will discuss the prospect of the global ecosystem, as well as the roles of startups in the post-COVID-19 era. And the topic of discussion for session four will be partnerships with startups to promote innovation in developing countries. For more information, please visit our official website at www.gigf.kr. Once again, thank you very much for joining us, and we hope to see you again tomorrow. Thank you, and goodbye.